Hello, this is the Stories Beside channel. I release videos every day for you. Subscribe and click the bell. Betty was embroidering a painting. It came out quite beautifully. A warm summer landscape, a quiet lake, birch trees, green grass, all illustrating the real nature. The woman looked out the window and there was exactly the same picture. That is why Betty decided to embroider this particular picture. This hobby appeared at her long ago, since her own daughter left for the city. The woman herself was already in her 70s, and she lived alone in her native house in the village of Dawn. Here all summer shone gentle sunshine, and under the autumn made the ground colorful leaves of maples. Everything was pleasing to the eye, only it was boring for the woman to live alone. Earlier at least there were neighbors, but now someone had already died, someone's children were taken away to the city, and someone's grandchildren came only in the summer to sunbathe in the sun. And it wasn't that there was nothing to do. The whole house was shining with cleanliness. There was food for a week, and the orchard had apples in time. Betty missed her daughter Kate terribly. She had moved out God knows how many years ago and had gone to college. She finished her studies in the city and started her own life. At first she tried to visit her mother almost every week. Then these periods were reduced to a month, to a year. And then the daughter stopped visiting her mother altogether. She had her own children, her own life. Betty knew almost nothing about her, and she had seen her grandchildren only a few times in her whole life. How were they doing? Were they sick? Do they need help? These were the questions Betty asked herself every time she went to bed. But there was no word from Kate. It was July again. Summer was in full swing and many of the neighbors and their children were here on vacation. Who wouldn't come to the countryside in this weather? The lake is right outside the window. Kate was the only one who didn't take her children here. Betty invited her daughter and granddaughter many times, but they refused because they had a lot to do or they were on vacation elsewhere. The eldest Cranson had been to the cottage only once when he was two years old. Betty has not seen him once since then. And Maria, the youngest, not even once. She's one year old now. What do they do? What are their personalities? These questions remain unanswered. But Betty, don't despair. During the summer, she had someone to talk to from the younger generation, a wonderful family with a child lived next door. Thomas was only six years old and often Betty was invited into their home as a babysitter. The parents would leave with happy faces to spend time together and the woman would be left alone with this beautiful boy. He really was a wonderful, intelligent child. For his age, he knew a lot, even more than he needed to. He could count to 10 and read. And when his parents stayed up late, Betty would tell him stories to help him fall asleep. Thomas loved Betty very much. She replaced his grandmother, who unfortunately, he didn't get to see in his lifetime. But Betty fulfilled that role perfectly. Grandma Betty, do you have a daughter or a son? Thomas asked this painful question one evening when his parents were once again late. He and the woman were having tea on the veranda. There was a dim light, a floor lamp, and the full moon was shining down on them. A firefly could be spotted on the grass. Thomas often chased after them, trying to collect them in a jar. But all attempts were unsuccessful, and the boy gave up. Betty looked out the window and wondered. The boy had made her question again. Did she really have a daughter? They haven't communicated normally in about 10 years. Could she be considered a daughter in that case? Of course she is. The woman replied calmly, smiling as she rocked back in her chair and looked up at the moon. Her legs were completely shrouded in plaid, the loudness of crickets rolling on them. Who? Thomas wouldn't stop. A daughter. Her name is Kate. She's a very nice woman. How come I've never seen her? She doesn't come here. Why doesn't she? I don't know why. If she did, she'd give you an answer. Probably me. She's just not interested in how mom can be. Not interested. You're very young, Thomas, but you ask very smart questions. You know, sometimes parents and their kids don't understand each other. It's like they're living on different planets, that's why. Kids drift away from their parents because they have a completely different idea of life. I don't understand you. The boy confessed and took a look. He seemed very upset. I don't understand myself sometimes, Thomas, but know that you are a very clever boy and someday you will remember my words. 
I will never leave my mother, the boy said firmly and with a touch of resentment. And rightly so. Your mom is the most valuable thing in life. She brought you into this life, educates you and gives you everything she can. Grandma Betty. Thomas started and got a little embarrassed. I'll never leave you either. Do you want me to be your child and always be there for you? The woman laughed and the boy threw himself into her arms. Betty saw a tear folding down Thomas's cheek. You're the best, son. The woman cheered him up. The boy smiled back and then laughed. Half an hour later, his parents came home. They thanked the woman for her services and invited her to tea, but she said it was past her bedtime. It was almost 11 o'clock in the evening, and even in summer it was better to keep some kind of sleep schedule. Betty returned home and immediately went to bed. She was very tired, for she had been with Thomas from this morning until late this afternoon. They had gone to the lake, then they had played in the garden, and after they were tired they had tea. The woman was very fond of such busy days. They gave her a taste of life. She felt young again, although seventy was no longer such an active age. Thomas stimulated in her a desire to live. She could devote the rest of her life to raising this little boy. The next day the woman sat with the child as usual. His mother was cooking dinner and his father had gone fishing. Once again they asked for Betty's help. However, this was no longer a whim of the parents. Thomas was really asking to spend time with her. Thomas you again. The woman exclaimed excitedly, approaching the boy and wrapping her arms around him. Me, Grandma, Betty, let's go to the vegetable garden. Mommy said it's full of strawberries. Laughed the boy with joy. I have strawberries growing too. Then we'll pick some at my place too. And I'll make jam later. You will come to me in winter, and we will enjoy this wonderful deliciousness. For about 20 minutes they picked strawberries in Thomas's yard. And when the last berry was put in the basket, Betty offered to move to her plot. Of course, it was smaller, but the strawberry bushes took up most of the garden. The woman often made jam from the berries. She had cherry, raspberries, and gooseberries. Suddenly Betty noticed that Thomas kept looking back. It looked suspicious. What did you see there, Thomas? The woman asked, picking berries. I saw some people walking around your house. What if they are bandits? The boy answered in a frightened voice and looked back again. Betty was also intrigued and frightened. She stood up quietly and slowly began to walk over to where the people were crowded. Her eyesight was poor, so she just saw the outline of a woman with a baby in her arms somewhere nearby. This calmed her down, because the woman could not do anything terrible, and the neighbors were nearby. So Betty boldly went towards these uninvited guests. But as soon as she got closer and saw a familiar face, her eyes immediately widened. It was her daughter Kate and her children. Now the woman quickened her step even more. She couldn't believe it was really happening. They hadn't seen each other in 10 years. Kate called Betty's name to the woman for reassurance. She turned around, of course. She was holding a baby in her arms and smiling. Mommy, Kate exclaimed and threw herself into her mother's arms. How long it's been, how long it's been, Mom. I'm so happy to see you, Kate. My dear Kate, and my blood. Betty was glad to see her daughter. She was crying with joy. How unexpected it all was. Thomas also joined them, who obviously did not understand who all these people were and what they were doing here. Thomas, remember I told you about my daughter? Well, it was she, Kate, who was explaining Betty to the boy, and the one who left you. The boy asked skeptically. Betty even got angry at being so ill-mannered to say such a thing in front of Kate. What kind of nonsense is that? But then she precipitated herself by reminding him that he was just a little kid. They quickly glossed over the comment. Thomas went into the house to meet Fadia, and Betty ran to boil the kettle. Kate, on the other hand, sat on a chair near the table, crabbling the infant, and looked around the house. And nothing had changed here since then, she concluded. Still the same walls, the same dishes. How nice to go back to childhood. Kate watched her mother, who was developing tea in mugs. The children had already found something to do. They began to look at different figures made of wood. Thomas tried to tell them something about these creations, but he was only six years old. And of course, it looked pretty funny. A six-year-old boy describing a geometric figure to a five-year-old 
and trying to make it as scientific as possible. Finally, Betty served tea and sat down at the table across from her daughter. She, looking at her, couldn't. The one had dyed her hair, changed her hairstyle, and changed her style and clothes. She was simply unrecognizable. Honey, it's been so long since I've seen you. Betty said, looking at her daughter. What's new? What news? Well, tell me everything. I can't take it anymore. I haven't seen you in 10 years. Just think about it. Kate smiled, took a sip of tea, and then began her story. Nothing new, really. Now we live with Alex. We raise kids, we work, we're tired. You probably got a telegram about the birth of the car. The woman pointed to the baby in her arms. And how's it going with Lesha? Are you doing well? How long have you been married? Five years. And your old husband doesn't hurt you. No more bad behavior. How's my Kelly? Oh, it's been so long since I've seen her. Kelly's fine, smiled Kate. She's graduating this year. She's dating a guy. Soon she'll make me a grandmother and you a great-grandmother. Kelly was Kate's eldest daughter from her first marriage and these two youngsters from her second. With a new husband. Well, added the daughter, it's not all that important. The important thing is that we finally got together. I missed you so much. I'm like a daughter, you're here for the whole summer. Finally, Fedia can swim in our lake. Actually, Kate started with intrigue. I didn't come here for that. Yes, of course you did. I wanted to visit you first of all and to show my grandchildren. But there's another reason. What was it? Betty listened attentively. She'd absorbed every word her daughter said like a sponge, because then she would not hear the words from her lips for a long time. Or maybe she would never hear them again. She won't be treading this ground much longer. We're in financial trouble. I'm on maternity leave and Alex got a pay cut at work. We're short of money. Money? Oh yes, of course I borrowed it, daughter, Betty said with a wave of her hand. She got up from the chair, went into the living room. She started frantically searching through the dresser. Kate realized what she was looking for and stopped her, saying, No, Mom, I don't want your money. Betty turned around and looked at her questioningly. I don't want your money. Kate repeated calmly, beckoned her back to his side. Betty sat down next to her, but already with her wives. Now she didn't know exactly what her daughter wanted. Actually, it's the money that's needed, but not what you want. Much more and I know another way to get it. That's where I need your help," Kate explained. So I'm listening, the mother replied with interest. You know about the maternity capital, but I do. Then you know that I can be given money for certain expenses children's education, expensive treatment, and so on. But unfortunately, now our situation is such that I need to somehow feed my family. And what the state allocates is non-cash money. That is, I can only spend it on something specific. So recently smart people have told me one way to cash this money. It's perfectly legal, a lot of people do it. Kate paused. Come on, no shade, Betty hurried on. She was already eerily curious about what her daughter would say. I can supposedly buy real estate from relatives. They'll give me money for it, you know? Of course, I won't really pay you anything, but I'll own the house and I'll divide it between my children. You want to buy the house from me? Betty got worried. Where will she live? What will happen to her? Does her own daughter want to throw her in the garbage? Yes, nodded Kate. But don't worry, of course you'll keep it all. Nothing. I don't want your house. I need the money the state will give me. And you're still living here like you have been. You just won't own it. That's all. Betty thought about it. On the one hand, it sounded like a very ingenious scheme, but some kind of scam. If they were exposed, what would happen then? It was very disturbing. Who would do it though? Does anyone really need a house in some godforsaken village with an old grandmother in it? So the woman decided to go along with it. This is her own daughter, and she needs help now. Besides, it wasn't a big deal to just sign the papers. Who cares who the house is registered to? Especially since it's her own blood kidney. Oh great. Then let's bring the documents in a week and we'll formalize everything. Kate was happy. They sat for another 10 minutes, talked about various things, and then the daughter, citing the fact that Maria had to go to bed, went to her room, leaving Betty alone again. Though no, Fedia and Thomas were still in the house. 
Grandma Betty, are you selling the house? With horror in his voice, the boy said, approaching the woman. Tears seemed to come to his eyes. No, actually, yes. But you will leave me. Thomas was already in tears. He seemed to be frightened. No, of course I'll stay here. It's just a formality. So you'll always play with me. You'll never leave me. Of course not. Betty soothed the boy, stroking his shoulders. In the evening, her daughter and her grandchildren left. To think, she hadn't even stayed the night. Betty was very disappointed and upset, but told herself that she certainly had a lot of things to do and worry about. A week went by, and there was no news from Kate. Betty had already decided that Kate had changed her mind, and the deal would not go through. But one weekday morning she received a letter. It said that the woman needed to come to town to get the deed notarized. Betty was very worried about this offer. It had been a long time since she had traveled to the city. Especially now she was old. How could she survive the three-hour journey in such a state? And on the electric train, she might have to stand at all. But there was nothing to do. Her daughter asked, and Betty couldn't give her a ride. The next day she started to pack her bag, took her passport, all kinds of documents for the house, and of course, prepared a travel ration. Who knows how long she would be there? Thomas came into the house. He watched the woman's movements very carefully. She was looking for some important paper. When she found it, she shrieked with joy. It was only then that she noticed the boy and was embarrassed. Thomas, surprised, Betty put the folder and things in her bag. Where are you going? The boy asked impishly, approaching the woman and peering into her bag. Going to town. The woman answered indifferently. No, she didn't want to offend the child, but now she was making sure that she didn't forget anything. Otherwise, she would have to go home and drive again, which Betty certainly didn't want to do. The notary is a serious man. Some document was missing, you could already go on your way out, and the letter detailed exactly what to bring with her. In the end, Betty decided to just bring everything she had with her. It was the right thing to do. You said you wouldn't leave me, upset. Thomas stretched out. I'm not leaving you for God's sake. The woman couldn't take it anymore. I have business to attend to. You hear me, business. A grandmother my age has business too. I don't live only for you. The boy pulled away and looked at the woman with eyes full of horror. It was obvious that he was ashamed. But at the same time these words hurt him terribly. He cried and ran away. It was only then that Betty realized what she had done. Taking it out on an innocent boy. What was she like? She wanted to chase him down and explain herself, but time was running out. The train was due in an hour, and she was already terribly late. The train station was not far away, but for a woman of her age it was quite difficult to walk that distance. She came to the bus stop, got on the right route. Having reached, appeared in the direction of the railway station. There was very little time left. Judging by her broken clock, she was almost running and as if by the law of meanness. There was a line of several people at the ticket office. Betty, breathing heavily after her run, was the last one to get in. Every now and then she nervously glanced at her watch and fidgeted. Excuse me, she called out to the woman. The woman in front looked to be about 50 years old. She turned around. Could you please let me through? I'm very late for my train. It's about to leave. Why would you do that? Allow me, the woman replied. I may be late too, but I'm standing like everyone else. Is it your problem that you're not on time? I really have to. My daughter is waiting for me in town. We have to go to the notary, Betty explained. Almost. And my grandson is waiting for me, who has a birthday. I won't give in to you. The stranger insisted. No, but what a horrible person. Betty thought. Why can't you be more merciful to other people and answer a simple request in such a boorish way? Meanwhile, there were only a few minutes left before the train left. Finally, it was the turn of this young woman who stood in front of Betty. Meet to the city for tomorrow's date, please. The woman asked, and then Betty almost had a heart attack for tomorrow. To think of it. And this hardy woman couldn't let it pass her by. She was so upset that she wasn't even angry anymore. She was just hurt and hurt by the fact that there were such horrible people living in the world. Just as Betty approached the ticket office, she heard the sound of the train pulling away. All hope in her eyes melted away. 
she was definitely not getting anywhere now. For today, it was the last train to go to the city from the nearest station. The timetable had been cut in half due to track repairs. Kate will be terribly upset when she doesn't see her tomorrow at 8 o'clock at the notary's office. She let her daughter down. Where are you going? The cashier brought her out of her musings. Betty looked at him with despair in her eyes already nowhere. She answered in a despondent voice and walked back to the bus stop and home from there. Now Betty didn't even know what to do. She didn't have her daughter's phone number. She had, but she had left her number for her a long time ago. Betty had written it down on a piece of paper before, then stuck it somewhere in her desk and that was the end of it, and Betty hoped she still lived here. The woman climbed the stairs to the high floor. Since the elevator didn't work, she was almost suffocating and hoped Kate was home and would give her a drink. She felt very hot and sick to her stomach. She rang the doorbell. There was no answer for about three minutes. Betty decided to call back until she was victorious. Finally, footsteps were heard. But were they already asleep? It was only 10 o'clock at night. But when the door fell open, the woman was startled by what she saw. It wasn't her Kate standing in front of her. It was a young girl of about 25. Her hair was dyed white, and her locks fell beautifully over her shoulders. She was wearing a house robe. A small baby ran out after her, but he was immediately picked up by a strange man. Good evening. Can I help you? Asked the pretty girl. She seemed a little haggard, but she tried to be polite. Betty liked that right away, but she still didn't understand what this girl was doing in her daughter's house. I beg your pardon. Isn't this where Kate lives? Betty inquired in a husky voice. Still, she couldn't catch her breath. Kate, she used to live here. And who are you to her? I'm her mother, the woman said. And after this phrase, her eyes went dark and her ears began to ring. She woke up and was leaning against the wall. Are you all right? Concerned, the strange girl tried to help the stranger. Betty seemed to be losing consciousness. Then the girl called for her husband. Together, they brought the named guest to the couch and laid her down, making her comfortable. The girl brought a glass of water and sat down opposite. After a few minutes, Betty felt better. She didn't dare to speak yet and tried to calm down. Excuse me, please. The woman apologized, taking a sip of water. The elevator wasn't working and I have a weak heart. It's okay, it happens to everyone. The girl cheered her up. What's your name? Betty. I'm Daria. It's very nice to meet you. Weren't you looking for your daughter, Kate? Yeah, I had that address in my address book. I've never been to her house and I'm rarely in town. Almost never. I had an emergency today. I thought my daughter would meet me and take me in. It was she who called me to the notary, to the notary. Daria asked me again. Not that she was interested, but rather she was being polite and trying to calm the woman down. Yes, there's some paperwork to be done, Betty explained, taking another sip of water. Do you have Kate's cell phone number? Daria suddenly asked. No, I've always written her letters. I know it's old fashioned, but I don't know anything about these phones. Wait, what am I doing? The young mother exclaimed. I have her phone number. I'm afraid to ask how. Well, we bought this apartment from her two weeks ago. The price was very attractive because she needed to sell it urgently. I don't know why, but my husband and I went for it, and it was a good deal. Look at the renovations, and we're a young family. She didn't tell me she sold the apartment. She needed the money, but why go to extremes? She did say something about leaving. I don't know where, but leaving very soon, Daria answered, flipping through her phone's contact list. I found it. We'll call you right now. It beeped. A minute passed, but no one answered. Let's try again. Daria didn't give up. But when she tried again, the result was the same. Kate was unavailable. How strange. Maybe she's asleep already? Did you make an appointment? No, not at all. But it was just a matter of course. She knows I don't have anyone in town to sleep over. I wanted to go to her place in the afternoon, but I didn't get there until the evening. And it turns out she doesn't even live here anymore. Don't get me wrong, Daria began carefully, but I think your daughter is strange. How could she do that to her mother? Well, I'm sure she didn't mean it. Betty herself didn't use those cell phones at all. Why would she? In the village, they say they can get a telegram from them. 
Well, you'd have to go to the post office, take a bus, and she didn't have the energy. Why didn't her daughter come for her herself? She has a car. Betty somehow came home, sat on the porch, but she couldn't breathe much, and began to think about what to do next. Her thoughts were interrupted again by Thomas, the fidgety Thomas. He seemed to be still reeling from the situation that had happened two hours ago. Why didn't you leave? He asked. Did you miss your train? The woman replied dejectedly. She was in no mood to talk to the boy. Thomas came closer and sat down next to her on the step. It used to be painted green, like the whole porch, but all the paint had long ago almost come off. And now the porch, once so beautiful, looked abandoned and askew. Betty tried not to think about how badly her home had become dilapidated after the death of her husband, who used to take care of the household before his illness. Everything was slowly falling into disrepair. Why hadn't they had a son? He would have helped now, fixed it up, patched it up. And what will you do? Thomas inquired, not allowing the woman to be distracted. I don't know. She turned her head to the boy. He was looking at her with interest. But there was still resentment in his gaze. Look, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that she yelled, that she snapped at you. It wasn't your fault. I was just trying to catch the train. You missed it. And the characters in this station are not the nicest characters. Questioned the boy. There was a nasty woman there who treated me very badly. I missed the only train to the city because of her. The boy didn't answer anything, only waggled his eyebrow, and then ran away to his house. Betty did not understand the boy's actions at all. She seemed to apologize, but what can you take from him? He's a kid. She must have really hurt him, and he won't forgive her soon. Children are very fragile, and every remark can go deep into their hearts. And then that resentment could carry over into adulthood. Betty realized that it was not such a big trauma for the child. His parents probably scold him sometimes too. It's normal. Kids can be very naughty sometimes, cleany and fidgety. That's why adults often snap at them. But after a few minutes, Thomas came back. He was very excited about something. The boy came up to the woman and said, can you come with us tonight, and you're going somewhere? Betty was surprised. My parents have to go into town on business. They let you come with us. Isn't that great? Betty was almost crying with happiness. She had hurt this child so much, and instead he responded with kindness. Come here, my wonderful boy. Betty exclaimed, taking Thomas in her arms. He had given her a real gift. A few minutes later, they went to his house to talk to his parents. Good evening, Betty. The boy's mother said hello. Thomas told us what misfortune has befallen you. We're here to help. What time do you want to go? The woman asked, in an hour. But you'll have to get back on your own. We'll finish all our business in the morning and drive straight back. Well, that's not a problem. It's much easier to buy a ticket in the city. Betty thanked her neighbor. And so it was. Soon they were on their way. The woman was very glad that she could ride in a spacious and comfortable car. Instead of jolting in a jammed electric train for three hours, the ride was quick. Betty gave Kate's address, and they dropped her off just outside her house. She thanked them all profusely and promised to stay with Thomas as long as she needed to, though she always did. In her address her daughter had given her years ago, tomorrow I'm sure there'll be a good reason for this behavior. I'll find a place to sleep tonight. Doria glanced at her husband, then nodded affirmatively at him. Look, stay with us. I'll style you here on the couch, and in the morning I can take you to the notary. How's that sound? Suggested Doria with a smile. Betty couldn't believe her luck. Today already two good families had helped her out of such a difficult situation. It was a real stroke of luck. If you don't mind, I'd be happy to stay, Betty said. So they decided. Doria turned out to be very attentive shot the couch, fed the poor woman, poured tea. How come you haven't been in touch for ten years? Expressed Doria, knocking back her tea from the mug. I don't know, we'd sort of socialized before. Especially her talking about her kids' birthdays, congratulating me. Then it just kind of died down. I didn't even bother. Who needs an old lady like that? You should choose a grave. No way. What are you talking about? Harry Daria. You're a wonderful woman, but you're very unlucky with your daughter. My mother died when I was 16. 
I was crossing the road in the right place and the driver was drunk. The girl had tears in her eyes. If she were alive, how wonderful we would have had a wonderful conversation. She would have helped me with my baby. I don't think your Kate appreciates you at all. I'm sorry for your grief, but I think Kate is just that kind of person, not sociable. She was since childhood, and she was often bullied at school for it. And then, when she graduated from the institute and went to work, she became the wrong woman. Family, her own household, work. She didn't care about me. Oh, well, that's your business. The main thing is that you're happy. You are still a young family you will have more, Betty reasoned, bringing up your children so that they love and respect both you and their father. That they would visit you more often. Or else you really need a glass of water in your old age, she joked awkwardly. Daria laughed. Oh, it's midnight. I think it's time to go to bed, Daria said and began to quickly clear the table. Finally, Betty laid down on her makeshift bed and fell fast asleep. This day had really tired her out. This was certainly not the kind of adventure she had expected. In the morning, the smell of delicious pancakes wafted from the kitchen. Betty got up and looked at herself in the mirror. She looked quite presentable. The couch was soft, not like her home. An old rashad with nails sticking out of the upholstery and cushions that looked more like rocks. Oh, Betty greeted her cheerfully. Daria, good morning. Her husband was already seated at the table eating pancakes. You smell so good, so I couldn't resist and came in. Embarrassed explained the woman, entering the kitchen. Have a seat, your portion is ready too, Daria said. Betty sat down opposite Daria's husband. We didn't get a chance to meet you yesterday. I'm Betty, the woman introduced herself to the young man. My name is Leo. The guy replied in a friendly manner. There was a family idol in the kitchen. It was obvious that these people had really married for love. Suddenly a child's cry came from the room. Daria immediately jumped up and ran out of the kitchen. I apologize for asking such a question. Who do you have? Betty asked. Peter, I know it's a common name, but Daria, I've always wanted to name my baby Peter, Leo replied. Betty nodded with a smile. The choice of a name for her daughter had once been hers too. Her husband John had decided that because she had experienced such tremendous labor pains. So Betty had decided to name her daughter Kate. Kate sat more and more behind books, was not a sociable girl, and then moved away, leaving the old people alone. John died five years ago. The money that had been set aside was only enough for a decent funeral and a good wake. But what upset Betty the most was that Kate didn't even come to her own father's funeral, and even afterward didn't show up to support her grief-stricken mother. All in all, she had done a terrible thing. But Betty loved her anyway. Special people are always a little indifferent to the feelings and needs of others. And she considered her daughter special, otherwise how could she have gotten into the institute without any money? And then settled down in the capital, and settled down well in this life. Not everyone can boast of that. It is true that she is in a difficult situation now, but she will help her. It is her duty as a mother. After breakfast, Daria went somewhere to do some business, and on the way she took Betty to the notary. The woman really hoped that at least the address given in the letter was correct. When she got out of the car, she immediately saw the big sign on the house across the street. The notary entered the building, went up to the right floor, gave her name at the reception desk, and was invited to the lobby to wait. After a few minutes Kate finally appeared. She was dressed in a strict formal suit of black blazer, blue blouse, and perfectly lined pants. In her hands she held a brown file folder with papers. As soon as Kate saw it, her mother immediately approached her. Silently she nodded. This was strange. Usually people, even when they parted briefly, said hello to each other. No, Betty must have made a mistake somewhere in her upbringing. Not hello, daughter, the mother began. But the daughter immediately interrupted her. Shut up, please, she said sharply. Betty was even a little offended. What kind of attitude is this? Why is that? The woman started to boil up. I want to focus on the upcoming deal. Did you bring all the paperwork? You're not even gonna ask me where I slept last night. I'm not interested in who you slept with or where you slept. Oh, now you're talking like that? Betty's taking a sterner tone. She could get angry when she needed to. 
You'll never get a house with that attitude, you know. No money either. Kate turned to her and forced a smile. All right, mom, you're right. I was too rough on you. I'm sorry, same thing. The woman brushed it off. I guess it's the stress, the fear of loss. They all take a toll on me. Of course, when you urgently sell an apartment and not such things happen, Kate's mother remarked at her again. Keep quiet in this room. It's best not to talk too much about the transaction. Everything can play against you. See those uniformed men over there. They're definitely here for a reason. They're probably checking something. Maybe to see if the customers pay their taxes. You pay? Mom, I'm quiet. I'm quiet. I'm quiet. I'm attached, offended Betty. They sat like that for about 20 minutes. Kate was looking at something on her phone and Betty was looking around for nothing to do. Everyone was tense, shifting papers, nervous. Finally, a large group of people came out of the door, talking excitedly, and headed for the exit. A secretary approached Kate and Betty and invited them into the office. They entered, pulled out their passports and documents. Behind the desk sat an awfully stern and solid-looking man with expensive glasses. His eyebrows were furrowed in a frown as he studied some papers lying in front of him. Hearing the new arrivals, he looked up, so Betty and Kate. He asked, studying the women with a stern gaze. They nodded affirmatively. Please, sit down. The mother and daughter looked at each other and sat down in the chair. Kate, I understand you intend to buy the property from Betty, your mother, right? He asked the question. Kate nodded. May I ask what was the purpose of the man's drinking? Betty had already realized that it was the notary himself. You know, I have two small children. Not counting my eldest daughter who's a student. Our family has grown and we need more space. I live in a small apartment in the city. After the breakup with my husband, my kids and I have a one bedroom. Here you go, please read the paperwork. Betty couldn't believe her ears, how well she was lying. Is that why she sold her big apartment downtown a week ago? Do you live with your husband, or are you a single mom? The notary asked. He left the family as soon as I had my second child. Kate answered pitifully. According to the documents we are still married, but he plays absolutely no role in the upbringing of the children. Kate answered. So I asked my mother for help. She's willing to remortgage her house to us because her daughter looked at Betty with her eyes as if she were hinting at something. And then she even stepped on her foot under the table, and Betty realized it was her turn to lie. Yeah, I'm confirming. I'm about to go to the afterlife myself, and they have to live to see it. I can't leave them alone. But I can't leave myself destitute. So I offered my daughter to buy my house. And where will you live? The notary asked. I'll move to a nursing home myself. My daughter found me a very good one. The money from the sale will come in handy. I can't live alone for a long time. It's time to decide. Well, I understand, said the notary. You will pay for this purchase with maternity capital. He asked, turning to Kate. Kate nodded. They were asked to wait for the documents to be prepared. After two hours, during which Betty was already terribly tired, everything was finally signed as it should be. So, we'll send the documents electronically to the registry today. When will they register the deal? In about three working days, the pension fund will transfer the money to the seller. I'm returning your stamped certificate. We also need a power of attorney so I can get the money for my mom. Kate suddenly said firmly, What's that for? Betty started. Do you want to come here again? Her daughter asked dryly and made scary eyes. But what a thing to agree on. Oh yes, yes, Betty realized. Of course, you'll have to forgive me for being old. After another half an hour, the power of attorney was drawn up. All the best, concluded the notary, signing the document good day. Finally, they were free to go. Betty was terribly anxious to go home, away from all these complications, these papers, the crowds, the hustle and bustle and noise of the big city. When they left the building, Kate, having hailed her mother a cab to the train station, was about to say goodbye and leave on her own. But Betty stopped her. Isn't there anything you want to tell me? She asked sternly. What is it? The daughter was surprised. Why did you sell your nice big apartment? Was it just so that you could get the money for my house? But it's worth a lot more than that. 
Oh, Mom, that's none of your business. In the meantime, I gotta run. And Kate was about to leave again. But her mother's words stopped her. I went to your old apartment yesterday. A young couple had taken me in by fate. You must know them because they bought your old apartment. Why didn't you even tell me you were leaving? Why didn't you bring me into town for the deal? I thought you were worried about me. I thought you needed me, and all you wanted was that miserable money. Kate's face immediately became grim. It was as if she felt guilty for her transgression. And though she was old enough, she looked like a five-year-old child being told off by her mother. Mom, I had a terrible day yesterday. I had a fight with my husband and Masha got sick. I cried all day. I just physically couldn't take you in. We just moved in. There in the small apartment, not to turn around and ourselves, explained the daughter. And I couldn't come to get you either. If you only knew how busy I was, how I was traveling to solve all these problems, you made your own choice, Betty shrugged. But you could have at least told me that you couldn't give me a place to stay. I would have come in the morning, and you made me tense up the neighbors. They drove me to my car so I could sleep at a strange girl's house. Mom, I'm sorry. Kate came over and hugged the woman. The woman immediately melted from that hug. Her daughter very rarely hugged her. And today she must have been so conscience-stricken that she decided to be gentle. You're going home now, aren't you? Kate asked. Shall I go to the station with you, if you don't mind? But mom, what are you doing? And Kate really put her mother in a cab and went with her. Took her to the train, bought her ticket, sat her in a good window seat. And only when she was sure Betty was all right did she get off the train. At last Betty felt both needed and loved. Halfway through the trip, she dozed off and almost slept through her station. She was awakened by the man sitting next to her. When she finally reached her house, she sat down on the native wicked porch again and exhaled a sigh of relief. This adventure had taken so long, and she was so glad to be home. As soon as she was seen from the fence, Thomas immediately came running to her. Grandma Betty turned around, did you do all your chores? Shouted Thomas. Delighted. Yes, dear, replied the woman, stroking the boy's head and rubbing his hair. And it's my mom's birthday today. Did she invite you? You're coming, aren't you? Betty thought for a moment. She has looked awful for the last two days with absolutely no change of clothes. What time does she want me to come? The woman clarified. 8 p.m. come, it'll be fun. Betty laughed and nodded affirmatively. She had to shower, pick up her dress, dry her hair, and she was ready. It didn't take long to get ready. It wasn't her youth anymore, when it took her two and a half hours to get ready for the disco. Now she just needed to tidy up. Nothing more was required of her. Grandma Betty! exclaimed Thomas when he saw Betty entering. He ran over to her and led her over to sit next to him. It was a small group. Thomas's parents and a young neighbor, probably a friend. I'd like to make a toast, Betty said, when about half an hour had passed since the dinner had started. Everyone turned to her and listened intently. I want to thank a wonderful woman, a woman without whom this beautiful boy would not have been born. Thomas is so well brought up. Of course, he took an example from his parents, and especially from his mother. You raised him with tenderness and care. I want to say thank you for this wonderful little boy. Thanks to him I don't feel lonely for a wonderful mom. Everyone was delighted with such a fiery speech and immediately shook their glasses. After that Thomas even hugged his country grandmother. He also really liked these sincere words. Thank you very much, Betty. Thomas' mother replied politely. Without you I would not have been able to raise such a son. You are a real, beloved grandmother to him, who will give wise advice and tell him a bedtime story. Unfortunately, I cannot boast that I spend a lot of time with my child. No, work, unfortunately, takes away from us the most valuable thing. But every minute spent with him, I treasure more than life for Thomas and his grandmother Betty. Everyone was impressed with tonight's activities. Then we played cards, bingo and hide and seek. Everyone had a lot of fun, W. By 11 o'clock, Betty decided to leave. She was already feeling sleepy. She said goodbye to everyone and went to her house. Behind the fence, next to the gate, in the darkness she saw a huge box, but she didn't pay much attention to it. Maybe one of the neighbors was loading something, 
She would find out tomorrow. But today she was so tired. Betty decided to deal with it this morning. The day had finally come to an end and ended well. Despite all the difficulties and problems with her relationship with her daughter, Kate had made her very upset at first today, but then made her happy. She wants to change, you could tell. There was a reason she walked her mother to the train. Her daughter wished her the best. That's what she wanted to think. The next day brought another surprise under Betty's porch. At breakfast, she remembered the box that stood on the way out of the house. The woman went outside and became convinced that the huge box from yesterday was not a dream. Now she was able to see it from all sides. Attached to the top was a sheet with someone's signature on it. Betty put on her glasses, perused the document, and realized it was a warranty for a washing machine. It wasn't hard to guess that that was what was inside. There was also a note, Mommy, this is for you. The woman smiled and wanted to go call the neighbors to drag the box into the house. But then Thomas came up behind her and called out Grandma Betty, what is this thing? Betty turned around and with a smile answered washing machine. Did my daughter give it to me? She said, what does it do? What does it do? What does it wash? After this logical answer, the boy galloped away and the woman began to think how to get this behemoth into the house and stay alive. But she didn't have to think long. Soon Thomas's dad came to the rescue. He, along with another neighbor, dragged the machine all the way to the kitchen to unpack it and even hooked it up to water and electricity. It was now in working order. Betty thanked him with two jars of fresh garden berry compote. What's she like? She's thoughtful, isn't she? Betty thought of her picture every time she looked at her gorgeous gift. Summer was coming to an end. August always brought some kind of disappointment. For many people it seemed like the end of a happy life, the end of bright and warm days and good daylight hours. Betty was no exception. Before fall came she always felt homesick. For Thomas her ward, this time also meant a lot. He was going into first grade this year. He was very scared and he tried not to think about it, even though almost every conversation centered on it. One day at 4 p.m., when the sun had left its highest point in the sky, Thomas and Betty sat on the porch of the boy's house. It was a particularly sleepy time of the afternoon. Thomas's parents were picking something in the vegetable garden, and Betty was dozing off reading a book. Is it still possible not to go to school? The boy asked, looking at his fingers. It was as if he saw some mystery in them. Betty woke up and asked him to repeat the question, which the boy did. What's that? You what? The woman was indignant. I already understand everything. And now I have to get up every day at 6 o'clock a.m. and go to the school. But I can get the knowledge on my own. You have strange thoughts for a first grader. You should strive for knowledge. You don't know how much more you'll learn. And school isn't just about studying. It's about socializing with other kids. You have to make friends. Why do I need friends? Can I live on my own? Can you imagine what would happen to me if it wasn't for you and your parents? I always need help and you as my friend always help me out. Can I cope with my own problems? The boy wouldn't stop. Life is like that. In general, she likes surprises. Sometimes they're pleasant, sometimes they're terrifying. Is life so complicated that in order to live, you have to learn? Unfortunately, yes. Life is often unfair to people. Some get everything, others get nothing. There are many people living in the world, and some of them have bad intentions. It's not our fault, but we have to live with it. What a lot of obscure words you say, Grandma Betty. Thomas couldn't take it anymore and pouted his lips. Well, someday I'll be gone, and you'll remember my words. That was the end of their conversation. There was no point in explaining to a seven-year-old boy the complex system of big life. He's too young to understand anything. For him, the world is rainbow-colored and beautiful. In his opinion, there are only kind and sympathetic people in it. But that's not true at all. And soon Betty was convinced of this once again by her own experience. Soon the real fall came. Yellow leaves were slowly falling from the trees. Bursting, brown, chestnuts, sprouts were lying everywhere, and a tree was growing just opposite Thomas's parents' house. The temperature was gradually dropping. Betty increasingly began to prefer reading the book at home to reading outside. 
She asked the local men to chop enough wood for the rest of the fall, maybe even the long winter. Now Betty stoked his stove almost every day. Thomas left for town, and before he did he said a long and tearful goodbye to his grandmother. He really did not want to go to school. The boy was afraid that he would forget about his grandmother Betty and would never come here again. After all, childhood was over, in his opinion. But of course, it wasn't. And Betty was already looking forward to the next summer, to meet again her dear boy who was growing up before her eyes. One day in October Betty was washing dishes, and through the window she saw some strangers waiting outside her house. They were inspecting the facade and occasionally pointing at the house with their hand. The window through which Betty was looking was on the side and could not be seen from the facade. The woman felt a little uneasy. Many of the neighbors had already left, and the ones that remained didn't know her at all. Nor had she done anything to them to have any claim on her. She wiped her hands on her apron and went to the front door. Looking through the people, she made sure that these people were very interested in her house for some reason, and opened the door. They immediately turned their eyes on her. Good afternoon. Do you need something? Asked Betty. But when she saw the face of a familiar family, she was almost speechless. Betty, the girl exclaimed. What are you doing here? It was the same family she'd stayed with in Kate's former apartment. They were the ones her daughter had sold the apartment to. And now they stood in front of her, not understanding how this woman they had once sheltered could be here. I live here, simply, Betty answered. You live here? Leo marveled, looking around the house. Yes. The woman continued, not understanding what they wanted from her. What are you doing here? Betty? Oh, Betty, exhausted, stretched Daria. Come into the house. I'll explain everything honestly. This is all very strange. Betty, of course, gladly invited them into the house. She played the kettle, poured for her guests, took out some strawberry jam. And what are you without a baby? Betty inquired seated herself on the armchair opposite the sofa. Here's the thing. Daria began. It was obvious that she didn't know how best to start this conversation. The topic was too difficult for her. She didn't know how Betty would take the news. Your daughter, your daughter sold us this house and lot. The girl fell silent and looked up to see the woman's reaction. The woman sat with a devastated face. First, there was a look of incomprehension in her eyes then fear, then anger, and then anger turned to despair. Tears flowed from the poor woman's eyes. You're not wrong, Betty cried. Maybe she sold you another lot, and you came to this one by mistake. Unfortunately, no. Doria replied with sympathy in her voice. This is exactly the right address. Why did you buy this house if you knew I lived here? That's the problem. Kate assured us that no one had lived here for a long time and she priced it so low, we couldn't afford it. Plus, she called us first, because we'd already bought an apartment from her. She told us that we could also buy a summer house on favorable terms. Oh my God, I sold my own mother. The woman exclaimed in tears. Doria sat up to her to cheer her up at least by stroking her back. I don't understand why your daughter did that, but she was in a hurry, so she had to sell the property immediately. What was her hurry? Betty perked up as if coming out of a trance and depression. She didn't say. All she said was that it was urgent. So we got the paperwork done right away. Literally the day after the offer, we didn't even go to see the house because Kate assured us it was a scrap. Oh my God, Betty exclaimed. How could the heart not be in that line? She told me to sign the house over to her. And I did it out of the goodness of my heart. God, what a terrible thing she's done. She'll get that back and my bitter tears and my blood too. It's called Pot Luba. All my life I raised her, I clothed her, fed her, breathed her shade. And here is my daughter's gratitude. I understand your grief, Daria said quietly. But you also understand us. We had no idea that anyone lived here at all. Then we would never have bought your house. Alas, what grief. The woman agonized. Where can I go now, old decrepit women? Have mercy. Lord merciful, what will happen now? Well, wait, wait. Daria calmed her down. No one is kicking you out of here. She turned to her husband, looking for support. He nodded in agreement. 
We were only planning to come here for the summer and weekends anyway. You're not kidding? Is it true? The woman looked at her with hope in her eyes. Of course it's your home, you've lived here all your life. It doesn't matter who owns it. I'm sure we'll become friends. Daria encouraged her. She hugged Betty tightly and she slowly calmed down. Everything turned out just as Daria had said it would. They really became friends. The family came the following weekend. Betty vacated her room with the twin bed and moved into Kate's former room. Now it was even disgusting to be here after what she had done. Kate herself did not answer her calls or emails. The subscriber was unavailable whenever she was called. It seems the washing machine was her parting gift. Please come to the table, Betty called out to the family, putting the soup on the table. She had made an amazing borscht, which was appreciated by all the family. Betty, Leo and I have something to offer you. Daria said, My husband, and I noticed that you have a stove instead of gas heating. It's dangerous because it can catch fire. And you are not old enough to use the stove every day. And the rooms are pretty damp. One stove, the whole house doesn't heat up properly. Sure, sure, Betty agreed absent-mindedly. My house is already bad, but what can you do? But that's just the way it is, Daria continued. So we decided to install gas, put batteries, and in general, to make repairs, to improve the house, so that it looks more modern and was more comfortable to live. What do you think about it? I'm all for it, Daria. I'll even help you with money. My pension is small, but you don't have to, Leo smiled. We can handle the expenses ourselves. So they came to an agreement, and from the next weekend, Leo brought in the workers who installed the radiators and installed the pipes. Soon gas was piped in. Life began to get better. Betty helped the family as much as she could, cooking, cleaning. Her life was now very much like that of a servant. But she didn't feel that way because she had always been bored alone, who was there to do anything for? Now she had a kind of family, which needed her support, because the young mother was busy with the child, repairs, and some other remote work. And she was always sitting at the portable computer. And Betty was only too happy to make cakes for the oven, to put tea on, to set the table for everyone. The feeling that she could be useful again gave her immense pleasure. Little by little, the house was repaired. The walls were covered with insulation and plastered with wood paneling. The floors were renewed. The roof was repaired. No more leaks from the attic. The old stove was replaced with a modern fireplace stove and even changed the old furniture. Now the sofa wasn't so close to her feet and the table didn't burrow every now and then. At the worst possible moment, Betty rejoiced at these changes. This was a family that had become so close to her. Maybe she shouldn't have to live here. But still, thanks to them, her own life had really changed for the better. It was the 20th day of a sunny, warm April. The flowers were coming down in the garden and at Betty's. One of those spring days was her birthday. She was not used to celebrating it. Nor was she rarely congratulated by anyone now. Her own daughter had stopped doing that a long time ago. Close friends who died, who left, only her husband remained. But when he died too, there was no one to even remember this date. But this year, there were such drastic changes that they could not help but affect this wonderful holiday. All morning she was not allowed outside and forbidden to look out the window. Meanwhile, there was something going on behind the walls. It was hard not to hear even with her poor hearing. The sound of a big car or a tractor coming. What's going on in there? Can I go outside now, Betty? Daria's confused. Patience. Betty, patience. The girl answered cryptically. Finally, after 3 p.m., she was let out of the house. More precisely, she was blindfolded and led somewhere far away. When Betty smelled the pungent odor of fresh wood, she was already beginning to guess the surprise. When her eyes were finally opened, she almost screamed with happiness like a five-year-old. In front of her stood the very real little house with carved stevim railings. The stairs were also beautifully decorated with different patterns. The red brick roof glowed in the sun. Dear Betty, Leo began his speech, standing at the entrance to the door of the cottage. There are many things I would like to say to you on this day, but I think our gift will replace 1,000 words we are very grateful to you for giving your room to our little son, 
who will grow up and consider you as grandmother. You said you would live in the living room. But of course, that's no good. Now you are almost a member of our family, and we want to show our gratitude with this gift. We bought you your own little house. As you can see, it has everything from a TV to a toilet. We want you to feel comfortable too and have your own space. This house was originally intended to be a guest house, but then my lovely wife decided it would be yours. Alas, but when I die, it will be a guest house. Awkwardly joked Betty, wiping away a Betty tear. Daria fake outraged. The woman only laughed in response. Anyway, continued Leo, the whole team of workers and I would like to wish you a happy birthday and wish you health and many more years of life. Hooray! Betty thanked everyone and was finally able to enter her new home. It didn't feel like a guest house at all. It was a full-fledged house, just a little scale down in size. There were two rooms. The larger room served as the living room, adjacent to the cozy kitchen, and the door leading to the bedroom exited from there as well. The clean, sparkling tiled bathroom moved Betty to tears. Of course, there was no furniture yet, but as Leah said, it was a start. A week later the house was already being furnished. The first thing they did was to install gas and electricity. Betty was bought a very soft bed. She was embarrassed by so many gifts, because the family had done it all at their own expense. And why? She was a complete stranger to them. Betty didn't understand that, because they had no kinship. They are not even distant relatives to each other. Yet these people cared for her more than anyone else had in her entire life. Summer came. It had been incredibly hot since June. Everyone was already wearing shorts, and Leo and Daria had put a pool in the backyard. Finally, Thomas came to the cottage. Betty was looking forward to his arrival and even gave him a box of candy. Grandma Betty, do you live here now? The boy wondered. Yes, honey. It's a long story, but it's all right now. Someday, I'll find time to tell you this terrifying yet wonderful story. Now let's go sunbathe them. Betty replied. The boy did not hide his surprise he still did not understand who these people were and why they were living at Betty's grandmother's house and she had been moved. The family vacationed together in the sunshine. Thomas and Peter immediately found a common language and were already splashing in the pool together. Leo and Daria were lying under an umbrella so that the rays of the hot sun would not reach them. You know, I used to be a student of history and went to various excavations in the summer for practical training. Suddenly Leo, who was resting next to me on a chaise long, said out of the blue. Betty turned to him. Did you miss the antiquities? She suggested with a laugh. Not that I missed it, more like yes. I was just looking around at this land, at the old church in the village, and I remembered what you said. You said there was another house on this very spot and the village is over 100 years old. Right. Betty nodded affirmatively. What if there was something left here from that time? Very often, if you haven't done any excavations or changed the foundations of a house, you can find very interesting things, the boy explained. Here to the conversation joined the interested Daria, who came out of the pool and covered herself with a towel. Do you want to make a dig? Enthusiastically, like a child, she asked nodding with joy. Well, I didn't say excavate. Where? When? Thomas perked up. This topic has affected everyone on this site. So good. Leo laughed, raising his hands. Next weekend I'll bring a metal detector and we'll look for something. Everyone actively supported the idea. Daria told Betty what she wanted to find here. What if there is a silver spoon or coins from the XVI century? She marveled as she put Peta to bed. Would there be? The tired Betty answered monotonously, stirring her tea with a spoon. I'm sure it will. A week later Leo, as promised, brought the metal detector. Everyone crowded around the guy while he assembled the machine. Are we going to find old skeletons here? Asked the restless Thomas. I hope not, answered Daria sarcastically. And everyone laughed. Finally, the metal detector was ready for use. Leo stood up and began to move it from side to side. He barely nodded. The guy slowly walked forward and moved the device. Finally, the metal detector banned rather loudly. Thomas even covered his ears from the sound. It was clearly not a pleasant one. Oh my God, found it. 
shouted Leo. He frantically began to dig in the sand with his hands, but when he picked up the thing that lay among the grass, he was very upset. It was an ordinary gold earring, modern, not antique. He shook it from the ground, and Daria immediately jumped up to him. My earring, remember I told you back in February that I lost it to Betty. Did you really find it? The girl marveled, but at least someone was happy to find it. Leo didn't give up, he kept looking. From time to time he found rusty nails or a broken tin spoon, but there was no treasure. The guy wanted to call off the search, and everyone was getting tired. But suddenly the metal detector banned in a completely unexpected place near an old barn. There Leo did not find any earrings or nails. It was clear he needed to go inside the barn. But the problem was that it was locked. Betty, do you have the keys to this shed? Asked the guy to the woman. I'm afraid to cheat. Maybe there is somewhere. But it'll take a long time to find it. Upset, said Betty. In that case, we'll break it, said Leo. He brought a real crowbar from home and easily opened the lock. It was very weak, and the boards were literally falling apart in his hands. The junk, like the house itself on an old foundation, was probably over 100 years old. As they entered, the metal detector was again forbidding. It promised very loudly. Daria and Thomas covered their ears to at least shield themselves from the horrible noise. There was no floor in the barn. The ground here was completely bare, hard, from the pressing, like stone. Looks like we need a sturdy shovel, Leo reported, and went off again to find the right tool. Betty, do you think there's anything worthwhile in there? Asked Daria the woman. I really hope so, because it would take quite a lot of effort to find out, she said. Five minutes later the guy came back with a huge shovel. He once again ran the metal detector over the location of the supposed treasure. The machine was again forbidding, which meant that it was necessary to act. The earth did not yield to the shovel for a long time. It was terribly hard. But in the end, Leo did start digging. The excavation took several days. The housemates were already laughing and teasing Leo to stop doing nonsense. He would spend so much effort and find only another rusty lock. One day the family, except for the hard-working treasure hunters, sat around the kitchen table drinking tea. Thomas, who had come to visit Peter, was talking about his new school friend. I hope this Roma is a good boy, Betty remarked. Well, of course he is, replied Thomas. He and I are building a model airplane together. Suddenly, they heard a scream from the backyard. Oh my God, Jesus Christ! Leo yelled. Everyone immediately looked at each other and rushed to the scene. Leo, are you okay? shouted Daria Du, running to the barn. Daria Betty, hurry up and get over here, continued to yell the guy, as everyone came running and approached. What they saw struck them to the core. At the bottom of a wide hole, almost a meter and a half deep, they could see the lid of a large wooden chest with reinforced iron strips. Leo shone a flashlight deep into the hole and could not believe his eyes, what was it? His wife marveled. It's a real chest, a bloody old chest. We have to get it out of there. So Leo did. The final excavation took a couple more days. The heavy trunk was helped out by Father Thomas. Altogether, the household and neighbors stood around and looked at this amazing find with curiosity. The box had a thick chain on it, a lock, and unlike the lock on the barn, this one did not fall apart. It was very strong, though rusty, as if it had been made of cast iron. The wood, on the other hand, was cracked, but not once. The chest seemed very sturdy. Daria, bring it. There was, said the boy to his wife. Already in three minutes they sawed the old chain. Now it was just a matter of opening the chest and finding out what was in it. At that moment everyone froze. Everyone wanted to know what secret was in this ancient artifact, but it was also frightening. What if there was something very scary in there? But they decided to take their chances. Leo grabbed the lid and opened the chest. The contents literally blinded everyone's eyes. Mommy dear, Betty exhaled in amazement. The chest contained a lot of gold jewelry. True, somewhat tarnished by time, and underneath them real gold old royal coins. Everyone was in shock, no one understood where this chest came from, how it got here. 
it was quite clear that this jewelry carried not only monetary value, but also historical value. They dragged the chest into the house, and late at night held a council on what to do with it now. At the table sat all three of them Daria, Leo, and Betty. We should call the police, Leo said after a long silence. Why would we do that? Daria was indignant. These treasures are rightfully ours. We're not going to give them to anyone. It's our treasure. Don't you want to give our child a happy life? Our child already has a good life, her husband told her calmly. And hiding this treasure will result in a fine. And a very big one, Daria begged him. Let's think about it for at least a week and decide what to do about it. Maybe someone can give us some advice. Who can give us some advice? What advice? If you're going to hide this treasure, who are you going to tell? Have you forgotten about the neighbors? They already know. Daria hung her head and was silent. Betty had been silent all this time, but this time she decided to say something. I agree with Daria. You can't decide things in a hurry. We should think about it carefully, at least to find out to whom we should hand over the find. The police are hardly a good option. Leo did not agree for a long time, but finally the women convinced him to wait. Life went on as before, and outwardly, nothing had changed, as if they had never found the most valuable treasure in their lives. And somewhere far away from here, in the Czech Republic, lived Kate, who had now left the country. It had been over a year since she'd snuck out without even saying anything to her mother. It was for this very purpose that she had sold all her possessions to go abroad. The thing is, she and her husband had run up huge debts. He was put on the meter by the very real bandits, to whom he owed a large sum. Thus, the family hoped to escape persecution and solve all their difficulties. And this they, strangely enough, succeeded. One evening, while tidying up in front of the mirror for another outing, Kate saw that an old friend was calling her. They'd been very close since childhood. Born and raised in the same village, they both moved to the capital, where their paths diverged. But after a few years, they became friends again and kept in touch. Katenka, my friend said into the phone. Anya. The woman was surprised. How long has it been since I heard your voice? How are you? What did you decide to call and reminisce about your youth? I'm fine. I'm calling to tell you something. Is it about your mother? Those words really intrigued Kate. Yesterday, I was at a party with my relatives. Well, there was Grandma Nina, Aunt Natasha. My grandma Lucy. Maybe you remember? Anya asked. Well, how can you forget her? A fighting woman. So, she told me something that made the hair on my head stand on end. You won't believe it, but don't tell the shadows. Kate nudged her friend with curiosity. Grandma Lucy told me a legend. At first I thought it was all nonsense. But as soon as I heard your name, I realized it was true. She said that a long time ago, a baron who lived in this village in our region fell in love with the serf. He courted her in every possible way. They even had children together. One day he gave her a whole chest full of the Tsar's chervonets, jewelry and other valuables. Times were troubled. He probably decided to save at least some of the family treasures. He thought no one would be looking for it in her backyard. Anyway, this is the backyard. Don't fall down. That's where your mother's house is now. Wow. Kate marveled, waving. Yes, yes, confirmed her friend. And in the revolution this former serf bearing gave her a free hand. He hid the chest somewhere in the ground. But she didn't have time to take it back. She was killed then and all her children. The baron's bastards. The chest has never been seen since. And rumor has it it's still lying around in your mother Kate's house. Kate felt devastated when she heard about her mother. She still didn't fully understand the meaning of her friend's words. But as soon as she realized how the situation had turned out, she answered very sharply and firmly thank you for the information. A friend has to do me a favor. Hi, she called her husband. The theater is canceled. We're going home. In Betty's house, or rather, in her former house, everything was very quiet. The housemates no longer argued about the trunk. They hid it in a safe place where even the most insidious thief could not get into. One early morning, when everyone was still asleep, Daria heard a knock on the door. The knock was so nasty and annoying that she had to get out of the warm bed 
and go open the door. She hadn't expected to see Kate at the door. She was clearly in an irritated mood. But hello, haughtily greeted the former landlady of the apartment. Hello, Kate. Why are you here? Daria began, but she was interrupted by this boorish woman. I will ask the questions, she said and, pushing Daria out of the way, entered the house. She examined him for a long time and then just as primely asked where is my mom Betty? So it is. Did you evict her? How dare you? Kate screamed. You won't even let me say a word. Daria couldn't take it anymore. Betty lives in the new house we built for her. You haven't been in touch for a year. You sold the house with your own mother. Leo came in, and then Betty came out of the yard. No one expected to see Kate here. Kate, Betty said. There was anger in her eyes. Mommy, how glad I am to see you. Kate immediately changed her appearance and went to her mother to hug her. But she refused the hug. The mother forcefully pushed her daughter away and uttered terrible insults. You're not my daughter anymore. What are you saying? Have you lost your memory? You left me here alone, and then you sold everything I had. And I believed you, I loved you. You're just a fraud. How dare you? Kate was indignant and rushed at her own mother. But then Leo's heavy hand fell on her shoulder. Kate, he began sternly, you're not welcome here. I declare this transaction invalid. Can you say goodbye to this house? Kate snapped and left with her head held high. Everyone had a bitter aftertaste from this visit. Unexpected guests from the past. Everyone gathered in the living room and began to think what to do next. I don't think she was joking that she canceled the deal. Daria said fearfully, I think she's just bullying us, Betty said. She looks very arrogant, Leo remarked. And the main question is, why does she need all this? Daria thought, putting her hand under her head. She just appeared out of the blue, accosted us, and makes some kind of scandal. What for? God only knows where she's been all this time and what's on her mind. Leo caught it. But most importantly, we must not tell her about the treasure. She must never know that we have found something here. Betty, do you understand? She's not my daughter anymore and she'll never know. I guarantee you that, Betty replied firmly. She was really confident in her decision. Kate didn't just undermine her authority, she betrayed her mother and thereby destroyed everything that Betty so zealously wanted to preserve. She didn't need this warm relationship, she didn't need her mother. She is a cruel and cynical person. I don't know where she got such cynicism and indifference, but now it definitely wasn't Betty's daughter. This was no longer the naive girl she had once loved so much. Two days have passed since this unexpected visit. Betty was walking with Thomas and discussing school matters with him. Suddenly the boy asked a completely unrelated question. Grandma Betty, aren't you going to give me the gold coins from this treasure? I'm sorry, the woman did not understand. Well, I helped you find the treasure. Don't I deserve a reward? Thomas, I'm sorry, but this money doesn't belong to you. Asterisk, 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 translated using www.depo.com slash translator, free version. Asterisk, 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 who do they belong to then? The boy suddenly raised his voice. To you and your new family, you don't need me anymore. That's not what friends do. Thomas, you've got it all wrong. The boy dropped Betty's hand sharply, stopped and looked at her with an angry and hurt look. Are you a bad friend? He said, turned around and ran back to his house. Betty was left alone. She didn't understand why Thomas was upset with her. He was already seven years old. Hadn't he been taught not to take other people's things? She returned home in a terrible mood. Thomas was nowhere to be seen. He seemed to be holed up at home. In the evening, she went to the big house. Daria and Leo were having dinner and discussing something heatedly and cheerfully. She didn't want to intrude on their family idol. Betty was about to quietly leave, but the couple did. Betty spotted her. Where are you going to sit with us? The guy invited her in. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to disturb you. The upset woman explained, approaching the table where the couple were sitting. On the contrary, we wanted to ask you for a wife, said Daria. Alex and I want to go for a walk for half an hour, and Petia has no one to leave him with. Would you mind? Sure. I'll sit with him. 
Betty answered ahead of the request. The young people thanked the woman profusely and left. How wonderful it is here. The Rhea marveled, walking slowly in step with her husband. Suddenly she noticed a small figure by the lake. The man was sitting on the grass and throwing stones into the water. In him the girl recognized Thomas. What is he doing while late at night by the lake, where his parents were looking? Daria already wanted to go and ask the boy what happened and why he is walking so late alone. But suddenly a dark female figure approached him. Leo and Daria hid behind the bushes. The boy was ready at any moment to jump out and protect the boy, but for now it was not necessary. They recognized the woman as Kate and decided to overhear the conversation. Boy, hi. Are you here alone? Asked Kate sitting down to Thomas. He was still angry and didn't answer right away. Not alone anymore. Finally, he answered rudely. Such a little boy better not go so late to the lake. What if he dragged the mermaids away? Ironically said Kate. Mermaids don't exist, it's a legend. But what if it's not a legend, but the truth? People just don't believe in it because they've never seen them themselves. The legend exists to scare little children. But I'm an adult and I know where it's true and where it's false. Thomas persisted. But I don't think my legend will scare you away. What's even better? This story isn't fiction. What story? The boy asked interestedly. Are you sure you want to know? Kate intrigued him. Of course I do. Well then, listen. Many years ago, there were ordinary people living in this village. They farmed and were very poor. But one day a rich baron came here and fell in love with one of the villagers. He gave her a chest with a lot of jewelry as a sign of his loyalty and love. But this poor girl was so afraid that the treasure would be stolen that he buried them in the barn. She didn't even have time to try on these beautiful ornaments. She was brutally murdered by terrible men who destroyed the old power and even massacred the royal family. And where is the truth in this? Thomas persisted. And the truth here is that this girl lived on the site of your grandmother Betty's house today. She's not my real grandmother, I'm upset, the boy admitted. I know I overheard you two talking by accident while you were out walking. She did a terrible thing. But the worst part is, she doesn't want to share that wealth with anyone. I'm not her family, I understand. Thomas confessed. Thomas, don't you remember me? Kate asked a question. The boy tried to see her face, but the darkness hid her features. She took out her phone and dedicated the flashlight to the pumpkins. Are you Kate, Grandma Betty's daughter? Thomas exclaimed. It was so loud that Kate ceased at him. Hush, hush. No one can know about our conversation. You don't want all the money to go to unworthy people. Living in Grandma Betty's house. Of course I don't. She's my friend, not theirs. That's why I'm offering you a deal, Kate said enthusiastically. A deal? What's that? It's a contract between you and me. You tell me something, and I'll give you half of this treasure in return. What can I tell you? Asked the boy interestedly. You know where they hid the chest, don't you? They didn't tell me, Thomas began uncertainly. But one day I was playing catch with Peter, and we accidentally threw it on the second floor. There, in the bathroom at Aunt and Uncle Leo's, was that trunk. They put it in a big dirty laundry basket. It was open that day and I saw it there. Oh great, then a deal is a deal. You've given me information, now expect a reward. There's just one condition. What's that? Don't tell anyone about our conversation, or it won't work. They shook hands and Thomas, very satisfied, went home. Kate was about to leave, but she heard a rustling in the shore bushes. She came closer and listened, but saw nothing. She thought she saw something, she said, and left. When Daria and Leo were sure that there was no one else on the lake, they breathed a sigh of relief. Daria was still trying not to breathe. What the hell was that? Leo finally perked up. He was just furious at what was happening. Don't you see? The little boy was being used for his own selfish purposes. And he, knave as he was, believed it all. So she's going to steal the treasure from us. The husband wouldn't let it go. Yes, Leo, yes. We've got to run home and tell Betty. So they rushed into the house and caught Betty. Mila rocking her and the baby. She looked at their solid faces with incomprehension, and the couple was just panicked and all nervous. 
What's wrong? The woman asked in surprise. Putting a blanket over the baby, he finally fell asleep. Daria and Leo told everything they had seen and heard. Betty almost had a heart attack. She realized that her daughter was a real piece of work, but not to that extent. They talked about it for a long time and tried to figure out what to do in the end, Leo said. Okay, everyone, stop. I have a plan. They didn't know when the robbery was going to take place, but something told them that Kate wouldn't be dragging her feet about it. And they were right. The very next night, they spotted her creeping around in a protective colored raincoat in the bushes outside their house. She thought it was a great disguise, but she was very wrong. In the evening, all the family members took up their positions. Kate snuck into their house through an open window. She thought it was an oversight on the part of the owners, but even this little thing had been thought out by them. Everything had been done to trap her. The woman believed the knave Thomas and went to the bathroom. Though she herself turned out to be no less knave than the boy, the bathroom was located across from some sort of door. She assumed it was someone's bedroom. Leo's bedroom with Daria couldn't be ruled out, so the woman shouted as quietly as possible into the bathroom and searched for a large laundry basket. It didn't take long to find one, but what stupid people Kate thought. To hide such valuable things so carelessly. Suddenly she heard a sound in the hallway, as if something not very heavy had fallen. She turned around and listened, but saw no one and went back to her business. She carefully, without making a sound, pulled out that jewelry box. Not as big as they said, she thought. But as she opened it, she realized how bad it all was. That chest was a fake. All it contained was baby bling. She almost screamed out loud at the disappointment. Just then, the bathroom door slammed sharply shut, followed by footsteps and screams call the police. She's trapped. Kate tried to open the door, but it looked like something like a mop had been inserted into the handle, blocking the passage. And Kate was indeed trapped. There were no windows in the bathroom. There was nowhere to escape. She realized that this was a real defeat. There was nothing left for her to do but wait for the police to arrive. The door was answered half an hour later. No one had spoken to her during that time, and she couldn't even hear the conversation outside. Everyone was talking in whispers. It pissed her off terribly. As soon as the door opened, she was greeted by a full man in a police uniform. He immediately and ordered her to turn around. She didn't resist and obeyed. Handcuffs were placed on her hands. The man uttered the most banal phrase she had heard one billion times in movies. You're under arrest. Do you have the right to remain silent? Follow me. As she left the bathroom, she met Daria's eyes. She was glowing with joy that their plan had succeeded. And Kate was terribly angry. She hadn't counted on these people being so resourceful. The plan was very simple. Leo and Daria were in their bedroom exactly until Betty, who was standing in the snowy bathroom, closed in, signaled to the crowd with her foot. Immediately Leo jumped out of the room and slammed the bathroom door shut. The plan worked like a Swiss watch. Kate was put into the car and the family followed. They were all heading to the police station. Why did you sneak into someone else's house? Asked the serious man in the interrogation room. Kate had never been in such a room before. To some extent she was even curious about how such things happened. In another situation, of course, I refused to speak without my lawyer, Kate answered indifferently. You want to take this case to trial? Then I'll tell you what the outcome will be. Not only will you pay a fine, but you could go to jail. Maybe the investigation will uncover some more of your shady dealings. Is that what you want? What do you know about my business? Kate asked him suspiciously. Of course, it was a cheap manipulation. She wanted to change the subject. You either answer the question or stay in the detention center until the trial. The investigator pressed her. I wanted to take things from my mother's house, and she took it and said I was not her daughter. You see, she was very upset with me for something. Of course, it hurt me, so I decided to take at least something that belonged to me. And what was that? Some personal items, jewelry? Kate replied defiantly. Good. After a moment's silence, the investigator concluded, he stood up and left the interrogation room. Two police officers then came after the woman and took her behind bars. She tried to break free, but nothing worked. 
It was the turn of Betty and her family. They asked to be interviewed together, for they were not hiding anything from each other. So you knew about her breaking into your house? Asked the man with the glasses. Yes. That's why we were ready for the attack. Answered Daria. Why didn't you call the police at the first suspicion? Because I'm sorry, no offense to you. But the police work in our country is a bit strange. If we called you beforehand, we'd have scared her off, and she'd have done the theft another day. Then we certainly wouldn't have caught her at the scene of the crime. Leo replied sarcastically. But she didn't steal anything from you, that's what the investigator asked. No, but there was a break-in. She was trespassing on private property, Betty replied. She said she wanted to take personal items out of resentment towards her mother. Is that right? Everyone looked at each other. There was a look of surprise on their faces. No, Leo finally answered. It's a blatant lie. In that case, what did she want to steal from you? The investigator asked. Everyone looked at each other again. It was as if they were communicating with their eyes. And Daria gave Lev a meaningful affirmative nod. We better show it and formalize it. The boy said uncertainly. In what way? The man was surprised. These are historical treasures, which according to the law must be withdrawn by the state. Finally confessed Leo. At that moment he felt relieved, and everyone in the room seemed to feel the same way. Maybe it was for the best. Not getting rid of something that was bringing so much complexity into their lives as well. The slightly surprised investigator agreed with them and went to their home. Leo briefly told him the backstory of where they found the chest, how they found it, and why they were doing it. Then he told him about Kate, who had first sold her mother's house, and then threatened them to take back both it and the lot. And finally, they reached the very object of all the quarrels and disagreements, the ill-fated chest, and it was hidden right under Leo and Daria's bed. Well began the policeman, examining the contents of the chest, it should be sent for examination, and if it is confirmed its historical value, then there you will already deal with it. I have to confiscate it and hand it over to the appropriate authorities. Everyone agreed and the chest was confiscated. The conflict with Kate was resolved, and she was fined for disorderly conduct and released. And it seemed like the story was finally over. But the next day Thomas showed up at their house. He cried bitterly and couldn't stop crying. Betty comforted the poor boy for a long time, not understanding what had upset him so much. She gave him candy and tea. Finally, Thomas was able to calm down a little and tell her what was bothering him so much. I'm sorry, Grandma Betty cried on her lap. Forgive me, I'm so sorry. What are you? What are you? The woman encouraged him. But what's your fault? I told your bad daughter where you hide that damn chest. That's what's causing all this trouble. But we've made up our minds. Sweetie, Thomas, come on, I'm so sorry. I quarreled with you and betrayed you immediately. I'm a terrible friend. It's my fault too. I shouldn't have turned you down so harshly. We all have our faults. But the most important thing is that we can accept our mistakes. We learn from them. That's the main thing. Grandma, I love you so much. The next few months went great. Summer was coming to an end again. Thomas was getting ready for his second year of school, and Peter was finally about to enter kindergarten. The historical appraisal confirmed that the chest with its contents was a heritage property, so it now belonged to the state. However, they were paid good interest for the treasure they had found. Leo was promoted in his position, at work. They could now afford to buy a large, roomy family car. The Thomas parents became firm friends with Daria and Leo. A wonderful friendship developed between them. They invited each other to picnics, birthdays, and celebrations. The two families became very close. Betty was no longer alone in the remote village all year long, but now she had a separate room in her apartment. Now Betty's grandmother lived with them in the winter and took care of the child, while the young parents went out to friends or to the movies. And when everyone was at work, and Peter in the garden, Betty could enjoy a city social life unknown to her before. She went to libraries, parks, museums, socialized with her peers, even took up sports walking with a group of like-minded people. And there hasn't been any news about Kate in a while. Where did she go? What happened to her? How are her children doing? 
Was she still married? Betty didn't know any of this, but she almost didn't care anymore. Kate had chosen her own path. No one had forced her to give up her mother. Of course, it was hard for Betty to accept at first, but she realized that it had been a one-sided love all her life. Kate had never loved her in her life. Ever since she was a child, she had been a cruel and cynical person. A year passed. Summer had come to town again. All the ghosts of the past are slowly fading away, and in the family's memory, now they strive to keep in touch and help each other every day. Betty mostly helped with cooking and childcare. She gave various pieces of advice but did not push. Parents should decide for themselves how to raise their children. Peter loved her very much. Of course, he was still quite small, but he had already long ago pronounced the word grandmother. Betty was very happy about that. Things were getting better with Thomas too. He became more understanding and serious. He had only finished second grade, but he already felt like a big scholar. He liked math best of all. It was the exact science that attracted him the most. With math I can explain a lot of things, he said. I was told that when I am older, I will be able to study physics, chemistry, and geometry. I'm really looking forward to that. The families went to the lake as usual, had picnics, and of course, swam in the pool. Only now the idea of a treasure hunt was no longer so popular. Maybe there was something else stored here, but they had had enough of the story of the previous year. But one night, that family idol was disturbed again. The ghosts of the past decided to pay a visit to the present. The clock read about three o'clock. Everyone was sound asleep. Betty was resting in her separate house and Peter and his parents in their bedroom. Suddenly Daria heard some noise downstairs. She tried to wake up her husband, but he slept like a dead man. Then the girl threw on a robe and slowly went downstairs. She was terribly scared, especially because she had seen many horror movies, how maniacs or ghosts descend on victims. But this time the movies were right and her intuition didn't let her down. Daria stepped out onto the stairs and looked down. There she saw two men in black masks. Her heart sank into her heels, real burglars. She should sound the alarm. The first thing she did was to wake her husband. She turned, but beneath her there was a treacherous creak of the tulip. The girl stopped. The light of flashlights was immediately directed at her. Daria realized that she had been seen. She slowly raised her hands and just as slowly began to turn around. There were two useless muzzles staring at her, and each could shoot her at any moment. Descending past someone's male voice from beneath the mask, Doria decided not to test her fate and began to slowly descend the stairs. She was shivering and her husband, as luck would have it, didn't even hear the whole thing. As she descended, she accidentally hit a vase, which shattered. This should have caused a commotion and gotten Leo's attention but there was only silence on all sides. The masked robber took a wooden chair and placed it in the center of the room. Sit down, he commanded. The girl obeyed. As soon as she sat down, he pressed her against the back of the chair with a sharp movement, and his partner began to fiddle Daria with the rope. Where is your husband? The rough voice asked again, in the bedroom on the second. Quiet as a mouse, Daria took a risk. After these words, her mouth was taped shut. She tried to say something else, but now only mumbled. She was crying with hopelessness and didn't know what to do. Meanwhile, the robber went up to the second floor and forcibly lifted Leo from the bed. The guy was sleepy, so he did not even immediately realize what was happening. But the thief did not even take any chances. He immediately knocked out the owner of the house with a blow with a heavy buttstock. Leo collapsed to the floor. The muscular masked thief easily lifted the guy up and laid him on one shoulder. He brought him downstairs and sat him next to the girl who was holding on and trying to get out. Their chairs were tied together so that only their backs were touching. They couldn't even look at each other. After about five minutes Leah woke up, although there was no point in it anymore. He was as disarmed as Daria had been, and his mouth was taped shut. But finally you're both awake. But at last you're both awake, said a familiar female voice. Daria couldn't understand where she'd heard it. But when the woman took off her mask, everything fell into place. It turned out to be Kate again. Her partner didn't remove the mask. 
probably didn't want to reveal his anonymity. Tell me where the chest is. She ordered the guys indifferently, pointing the muzzle of the gun at them. Doria was silent. Kate thought she had something to say, so she signaled her partner to rip off the duct tape. But instead of locating the treasure, Daria blurted out you're going to die in hell bitch. After these words, she was immediately put back on the tape and slapped in the face. And you, hubby, drinking, pumping information from Leo, surrounding around him also something clever you want to say. How did your wife leave? The man shook his head from side to side, trying to free himself. So you're all going to keep quiet. Am I right? Kate asked a rhetorical question in a haughty tone. Well, then I'll have to motivate you in other ways. She nodded to her partner and he went upstairs. Daria immediately guessed why he was going up there, or rather, who was he going after? She started kicking, lashing out, bringing a chair, but it was all to no avail. When Kate's partner returned with their son, Daria nearly fainted. Tears streamed from her eyes. The robber was holding her son's hand, and he was sleepy and kept wanting to fall somewhere. The man put him on the sofa. The sleepy Peter, fortunately, didn't even realize what was happening. He just lay down on the couch and went back to sleep. Kate came even closer to Daria, standing face to face, and whispered, Oh, why are we crying? Yes, it's good for a mother to cry when her son is in danger. She pointed the gun at Pedia, the defenseless child who was sleeping peacefully on the couch. Daria was thrown into a shiver. She screamed as hard as she could, but only pitiful mooing came out. The tears were flowing. Kate came up to her again and ripped the tape off. Daria was in tremendous pain, but she wasted no time and screamed, don't you dare touch him. She was immediately gagged. But now Daria hoped that someone would hear her screams. And they did. Betty woke up from her fitful sleep to hear the screaming. At first, she thought she was imagining it. To be sure, she looked out the window, which looked directly onto Daria and Leo's house. She noticed that there was an unnatural blue light in one of the windows. She lost her eyes. The light didn't go away. Something's wrong flashed through her mind. She threw on her robe and as she passed the barn, she picked up a shovel just in case. She walked quietly to the house and opened the door cautiously. Before her stood a monstrous picture of Daria and Leo sitting tied up. Daria is sobbing. Leo is trying to get out of those ropes. Her daughter is here again. She and her partner threaten to kill little Pedia, pointing a gun at him if his parents don't tell him where the chest is. Betty is terrified, not thinking what she is doing. Runs up to Kate and gives her the hardest slap of her life. Kate even staggered back in surprise. What the hell are you doing? Betty yelled, get out of here, old woman, and stay out of my way. Kate snapped at her and started pushing Daria again. Your child is going to die because of your selfishness. Is that what you want to do? You're committing a crime. There's no more treasure here. How could there be? Kate smirked. All the while her partner stood with the gun pointed at the child. Betty, realizing the dire situation, grabbed the shovel she had brought with her and, as hard as she could, hit the bandit in the head. She missed a little bit, but she hit him with the edge of the shovel. The man started to shoot out of surprise and pain. Betty immediately rushed to Peter, protecting him with her body. One bullet hit the ceiling and another, another bullet hit Kate's heart. She looked at her partner in horror and collapsed to the floor a second later. She didn't even have time to say anything. Her breathing immediately stopped, her heart stopped beating. Taking advantage of the situation, Leo finally freed himself from the ropes and twisted the bandit's hands behind his back. Call the police, he shouted to Betty. She did exactly as he said. It didn't take long for the police to arrive, but Leo had already tied the bandit's hands, put him on the couch, and pointed a gun at him. Daria meanwhile took her son in her arms, carried him upstairs and kissed him for a long time. It's okay, sweetheart, it's okay, she told him, hugging him as tightly as she could. The policemen rushed into the house with guns, and ordered everyone to raise their hands and surrender. The bandit made an attempt to escape, but he failed. I didn't know you were such a fighting woman, Betty. Leo jokingly remarked as the criminal and Kate's body were taken away. Betty sat on the couch. Not alive, not dead. 
She was asked something, but she didn't understand and couldn't answer. Her heart was squeezing terribly. When they realized she was sick, they called an ambulance. And just in time. The clinic said she'd had a heart attack. Betty woke up the next day. White room, white ceiling, a nurse injecting something into her vein. Your relatives will come to see you soon, she said and left. A few minutes later Daria, Leo from Peter, Thomas and his parents burst into the room. They were all very concerned. Thomas had brought flowers, Peter a balloon, and Daria had brought Betty her favorite raspberry jam that she had made herself. Is this all for me? The woman wondered. It's for you, Grandma Betty. Thomas exclaimed and wrapped Betty in his arms. We're so glad you're feeling better. We were worried sick about you, Daria said. Oh, what a confounding thing to say, Betty. Betty spent another week in the hospital. Every day someone visited her, either Leo and Daria or Thomas and his parents, who shared news about everything that was going on in the world. Oh, and also when you get there, we're going to throw a cool party for you, he informed me. Only it was a secret. Jokingly scolded Betty when she was discharged. She still had to use a wheelchair for another month. But that wasn't a problem, for they now had a large car on which they could load anything. Finally, she was brought to her home. Leo loaded the stroller, put Betty in it, and took her into the house. As soon as the door opened, the lights came on and inflatable balloons flew up to the ceiling. Everyone was standing there with presents and cake. And with glee you shouted surprise. Betty thanked everyone heartily and sat down at the table. As she looked around the house, the memories of the past night cut through her mind like a knife. Her daughter had died and she hadn't even felt a thing. She felt bitter and ashamed of her indifference to her death. But she was terribly afraid for the fate of Daria and her son Peter, who were on the verge of death. Could it be that her true love lay in them now? By the end of the evening Betty was informed that her daughter's partner had been given several years in prison. Just like that, Betty had a real loving family in her declining years. They appreciated, respected and loved her for the rest of her days. Daria became like a daughter to Betty. She faithfully cared for her even when Betty herself was already quite ill. But for now, she had another full 10 years of productive and happy life ahead of her. Daria and her husband always remained sensitive and understanding. And when someone said that according to the documents they were not related and therefore could not be a real family, Betty only grinned in response. After all, a real family is not only people who have blood ties. It is those who love, respect, and care for each other. It's not just about blood, it's also about heart. Subscribe and click the bell. Charles, please think carefully. Barbara tried to talk some sense into her wayward son. She would never be the same. Why would you waste your life on a woman with a disfigured face? And the children? You'll want children someday, won't you? Don't you think they'll be afraid or embarrassed of their mother? They'll be teased if they see them with a mother like that. Son, I know you're being noble. But think of what's in store for you. You'll be tied to her for life. Mom, what are you talking about? Charles said with a wince, you can always get plastic surgery. Medicine today can put a person's face back together. We'll find the best clinic. I'll spare nothing for Monica. How much will the operation cost? Where will you get the money? You'll have to sell your apartment. And where will you live? Why would you put such a burden on yourself? Please cancel the wedding. Do you want me to kneel down? The woman hugged her son. Don't ruin your destiny, I beg you. How will you live with her? She's ugly. You won't be able to go out with her. Everyone will laugh at you. It's totally reckless to get involved with a woman like that. But I love her. Charles cried out. Don't you understand? Love? To hell with that kind of love. You'll find someone else. I don't need anyone else but her. I'll marry her anyway, no matter what she is. You have no right to forbid it. What's the world coming to an end with her? Look around, there are so many girls around, and you're so handsome. Anyone would be happy to marry you. Spare my nerves. 
Don't make any hasty decisions. Think it over. Things happen in life. If the wedding doesn't take place, the world won't collapse. You don't owe this girl anything. But it's my fault Monica's like this. How am I supposed to live with that? You don't know how I feel when I look at her. If I leave her now, who am I supposed to think I am afterwards? I've never been a scoundrel. You want me to betray her? Abandon her in her hour of need? You have pity in you, says your mother, and she's a bad counselor. First of all, you must think of yourself and me. I am your family. You'll have many women in your life, but only one mother. Are you trying to drive me to my grave? Barbara clutched at her heart. Ungrateful, selfish. To think he'd trade his mother for some girl. Maybe she's bewitched you. What are you talking about? Do you hear yourself? This is the 21st century. How else can you explain the fact that you value your own mother less than a stranger? Monica was on her way back from the treatment room. She was in a hurry because her fiancé was waiting for her in the room. She purred softly to herself, a simple melody. Her heart was overflowing with tenderness for her fiancé. She was already gripping the handle of the slightly open door when suddenly she heard, Mother! Charles looked at his mother in despair. Don't make me choose. You know I love you very much, but Monica means a lot to me too. If you love me, if you care about me, then give up the idea of marrying her. I think she must realize that there can be nothing between you now. I will never accept her, and I will curse her if you do bring her into our home. The girl, holding her breath, waited to see what the bridegroom would say. He was silent for a moment, then a heavy sigh was heard. Yes, Mom, I think you're right. I need to think about it. I'm glad you listened to my opinion. Remember, a mother would never do anything to harm her child. I care about you, about your future. It's good that Monica can't hear us talking. I have to find the right words so as not to hurt her too much. Oh, son, there were tears in Barbara's voice. How thoughtful you are. Monica stood silently with her back against the wall, tears choking her. Charles, a friend once suggested, I recently discovered a cozy cafe. You should like it. Would you like to come over on Friday after work? Why not? It's been a long time since we've met for no reason. In the evening, the friends went to the cafe. How do you like it here? Asked a friend. They had already ordered and were talking softly. Yes, cozy. There are few customers and the food is decent. Wait, the biggest surprise is coming up. He winked mysteriously. Suddenly the room was alive, chairs were moving, and his friend nodded toward the stage. Charles followed his gaze and marveled. A girl came to the microphone. She was incredibly beautiful, dark, thick hair, brown eyes framed by thick lashes, thin waist, and sensual lips. Music played and the stranger sang. Her high, strong voice penetrated the deepest depths of the heart, the most secret corners of the soul. Charles got goosebumps from her singing. Who is it? Charles could only say, he was so emotional he was speechless. Monica. He grinned, noticing the gleam in the young man's eyes. A voice of astonishing beauty. Would you like me to introduce you to her? No, really? Charles was embarrassed. It's embarrassing. Well, as you know, I wouldn't miss a girl like that unless I was already head over heels in love. Meanwhile, the stranger finished singing and the audience stood up to applaud her. The friends sat for a while longer, but Monica did not go on stage again that evening. Charles was conquered by the angelic voice of the singer. Secretly from his friend, he began to come to the cafe to enjoy Monica's singing. He tried to have time to take a table closer to the stage so that no one prevented him from admiring the girl. After each performance, he gave her flowers and soft toys. Monica. 
It was a month before Charles decided to approach her. May I invite you to a table and offer you a glass of wine? I don't drink alcohol, but I would love a glass of water. The girl replied with a smile. She had paid attention to this man for a long time. She did not show it, but she secretly sighed for him, regretting that he was too timid. The young man pushed back a chair, inviting her to sit down, and he called the waiter and asked for water for the lady. You sing very beautifully, Charles said, overcoming his embarrassment. I've never heard such a wonderful voice in my life. Is that why you come here every Friday? Yes, I come for you because I like you. Can I order something for you? Thank you, but I'm in a hurry to get home. Will you let me walk you home? Monica nodded in agreement. The young man was glad, paid the waiter, and left the cafe after the girl. I live nearby, she explained. It's very convenient. You don't have to adapt to transportation. Did you study singing somewhere? Yes, I did, at the Institute of Culture at the Faculty of Vocal Arts. You have real talent. Talent is 50% of everyday work, and the rest is a gift from above. What it took for me to succeed. You must have had a great future. Why did you give up the big stage? It wasn't just to sing in this cafe, was it? I can't believe this is what you dreamed of. You're right, Monica admitted. I had a successful solo career ahead of me, but one day, on a friend's birthday, we went to a karaoke bar. There I was persuaded to sing in public for the first time. I was accepted warmly. The audience did not let go for a long time and asked to sing again. And it was then that I realized that the big stage is not for me. I'm panic-stricken of performing in front of a large audience. So after I got my diploma, I got a job in this cafe. Why here? There's probably a more popular place in town, and the pay is probably different. What's special about it? I like the band of musicians. They have been entertaining visitors for a long time. Live music sang they liked it, and so it went. I don't regret staying here at all. Everyone treats me well. The owner of the cafe must have been happy to hire you. Yes, Monica laughed. He had more customers. Everyone came to hear me sing. I've been watching you for a month. You have your own fans who come to hear you sing all the time. Are you one of them? Yes, I couldn't wait till Friday to see you again. I'll admit, I've never seen that before. You're an amazing girl, and here's my house. Monica stopped. I hate to part with you. Disappointedly, said the young man, I would like to invite you to the movies. A movie? The girl smiled. Why not? Have you forgotten the last time you were in a movie theater? Charles and Monica started dating. Their quiet, calm relationship gradually grew into love, and three years later, the young man decided to take a serious step. Where are we going? Cheerfully asked Monica of Charles, noticing that instead of going home, the evening was approaching, directed the car to the countryside. It's a surprise. Smiling, the man replied. He quickly cast a glance at his lover. The evening was lovely, the sky was clear, and the air was fresh. Here we are. He stopped the car and helped Monica get out. It's so beautiful. The girl gasped. How did you find this place? They stopped on the beach, the golden sand glistening in the setting sun, as if there were specks of gold scattered among its grains of sand, invisible during the day. This is where my friends and I used to swim as children. From prying eyes, the beach was enclosed by a stone fence. They drove around the fence, and Monica shrieked in amazement. What is this? Sunset in the rays of the sun, flew poor plan, not a cloud was visible. Suddenly, on the blue blanket of clear sky, there was a white image of a heart. My God, what a beauty! Monica jumped, 
clapping her hands like a little girl. How could this be? These are my friends. Smiling, Charles replied. Monica didn't know how to declare my love. The man turned the girl to himself and looked into her eyes. This is the most wonderful declaration of love. Monica said quietly, Thank you. Monica? Charles grew serious. I love you and I want you to be my wife. He took out a small velvet box from his jacket pocket, opened it, and a modest ring with a garnet appeared to the delighted girl. Will you marry me? Yes, she answered in a trembling voice, putting the ring on her ring finger. I've always dreamed of a ring like this. Tears glistened in the eyes of the happy bride. How touching, my love. She put her arms around Charles and kissed him. I was afraid you wouldn't agree. The young man pulled away from her. He took a step to the side and from somewhere in the pile of stones took out a bouquet of flowers. I want us to never part with you again. I want to spend the rest of my life admiring you. I want our children to be like you. How can I refuse you when you've made all this beauty for me? You gave me such a beautiful fall sunset. You don't see that in the city. Meanwhile, the sun was sinking below the horizon, and the river was cool. Monica shivered. Are you cold? Charles asked thoughtfully, putting his arm around the girl's shoulders. Let's go home. I want to celebrate the engagement soon, and there's another surprise waiting for us. The young people stood for a while longer, watching the paragliders in the sky. It's a pity that the image of the heart disappeared so quickly. Monica was upset. We will definitely come back here, the man promised. And if you want, we can go up into the sky ourselves. They got into the car and drove home. You've made a real holiday for me today, Monica exclaimed. They almost didn't get into the apartment. When did you get here? She gasped when she saw the table set. In the center of the table stood a huge bouquet of roses. It wasn't difficult at all, Charles grinned, helping the girl to sit down at the table. One phone call, card payment, and dinner was on the table. You're a spender. Monica laughed. I don't spare anything for you. Raising his wine glass, the man said, I am the happiest man today because the woman I have loved for a long time said yes to me. What else is there to dream about? It makes me happy to give you gifts. You admire them so sincerely. I love you. I love you very much. Monica, looking at him with eyes full of adoration. I don't know how I ever lived without you. You're the most precious thing I have. It's so nice to have met you. We should think about getting married, but first I want you to meet my mom. Charles suddenly announced, Now that I've proposed to you, it's a must. Besides, mom's been dying to see you for a long time. I have to go on a business trip for a couple of months, and I'll come back and we'll get together. I'm sure you two will be friends. Mom's a wonderful woman. She only has one flaw. She loves me too much. He laughed. What if she didn't like me? That can't happen. If I like you, Mom will like you too. Don't worry, I'm sure you'll get along. Monica was counting the days until the return of her lover. She was anxious to meet his mother. One evening, the doorbell rang. Her heart jumped with happiness. Charles had arrived. Darling, I'm back, the man announced, standing on the threshold with a bouquet of flowers. I missed you so much. When I close my eyes, I see you. He stepped into the apartment, opened the girl's arms. And me. Trustingly, embracing her lover, she replied. I even marked the days in the calendar to bring our meeting closer. Let's not be apart for so long. It depends, but I'll try to be near you more often. Christmas is coming soon, the man informed freely, sitting down on the couch. I want to offer you a little trip. How would you feel about celebrating the holiday in Finland? I have the ticket in my pocket. He waved the ticket in front of her.
Do you mind? What do you mean? Monica got excited. I never even dreamed of such a trip. I've never been abroad. But tomorrow my mom is expecting us for dinner. No refusal is accepted. She is preparing, and if you refuse, she will be offended. You don't want to upset your future mother-in-law, do you? No, what do you mean? I'd love to meet her, agreed the girl. She was anxious. She didn't know how her future mother-in-law would feel about her. In the morning, I'll pick you up by car. We'll go in advance. Mom does not like it when late. And the weather promises not for walks. That day it was freezing in the morning, even though it had rained the day before. Slippery. Monica remarked worriedly, looking at the glistening crust of ice that covered the road. It's nothing, her fiancé reassured her. There is enough time. We won't hurry. The road is a road. Here and there, they got into traffic jams. They had to ride in the traffic. We are indecently late. The man frowned. Mom won't be happy. I didn't want to earn a reproach on the first day of our acquaintance. But it's not our fault there are so many accidents on the road. Monica was careful. She's a smart woman. She'll understand everything correctly. And on the contrary, she'll praise us for being careful. Try explaining that to Mom. Watching the road carefully, Charles said worriedly, She doesn't tolerate delays. Finally, we're on the highway. Relieved, the man sighed. Now we can step on the gas a little more. There are not many cars, and if we hurry, we can make it in time for lunch. Charles, please don't hurry. Monica tried to stop him. Look, the road is slippery, I'm afraid. You're not. The man waved his hand nonchalantly. I have a front-wheel drive beauty. will not let you down. Even if it skids, a little more gas will level itself. Listen, he asked the girl. Get some water. It's behind my seat. My mouth is dry. Monica unbuckled her seatbelt. She couldn't get it any other way. At that moment, the car swerved. Hold on. Charles shouted fearfully, trying to straighten the car, but the car was out of control. It won't listen to me. Charles. The girl watched in horror as the car swerved from side to side on the road. Do something. We're going to crash. Slow down. It happened in an instant. They were thrown to the side of the road. Charles tried to avoid hitting the tree, but the impact couldn't be avoided. There was debris flying. Monica was thrown through the windshield. Charles' airbag deployed. He lost consciousness for a while, his head hitting the door. People were already running to their aid. Kid, Charles heard someone's voice. Are you alive? We're going to get you now. Are your arms and legs okay? Say something. Monica? The man spoke slowly. Monica, is she alive? I had a girl with me. How is she? What's wrong with her? Tell me, what's wrong with Monica? She's alive, but the girl's unlucky. Her face was shredded by shrapnel. They're giving her first aid now. Hang on, kid. The ambulance is on its way. They helped him out of the car. Charles leaned back against the car, clutched his head. He was dizzy, but staggering, he reached the place where his fiancée was lying. Doctors were busy around her. Darling. Charles fell on his knees in front of the girl, crying, grabbed her hand and brought it to his lips, kissing her. Forgive me. I was a fool not to listen to you. I'm sorry. What have I done? With fear thought the man, looking at the disfigured, deep cuts on the face of his bride. It's not her. It can't be my Monica. Is this mess the face of my beloved? Is it my fault she's become like this? She'll never forgive me. God, there's no forgiveness for me. I, I can't feel my face. Barely moving her lips, the girl said. Charles, hearing her voice, realized that in front of him, covered in blood, 
really lame Monica. You can't talk at all right now, and neither can you, young man. With a stern look at Charles, the doctor said, treating the wounds, it wouldn't hurt to come with us. You look very pale. I'm fine. You're just in shock. You should be under observation for a while. Can you walk on your own? Yes, yes, I'll come with you. Monica, I'm with you. Don't worry, love, I'll be right here. Who is this girl? She's my fiancé. Monica, my darling, everything will be all right. Hurriedly reassured the man, sitting next to her in the car, he tried not to look at her. Charles? Monica asked in a whisper, What's wrong with my face? Tell me the truth. I don't know. It's bandaged. You'll be fine. They'll fix you up. Don't say anything. You mustn't worry. We'll go to the hospital. They'll fix it. Just hold on. I can't feel my face. It hurts so much. She cried and fell into darkness. Monica slowly opened her eyes. Well done. She heard a cheerful male voice beside her. She's awake. You gave us quite a scare. What's wrong with me? Slowly asked the girl. It was hard for her to look at the man leaning toward her. Am I in the hospital? You have a concussion. The doctor was silent. Your face and hands were the worst affected. Do you remember the accident? She raised her hands. They were bandaged. Monica brought them to her face, touched them, and cried out in pain. Yes, I remember. It was slippery. We lost control. And when you take the bandage off, I want to see my face. In a couple days. The doctor's been quiet again. Then we can assess the extent of the damage and decide what to do next. We'll need plastic surgery, and I think we'll need more than one. We'll do what we can. My face, is it badly damaged? Will I have any scars? Tell me, I want to know the truth. I don't want to lie to you, but you'll never be the same as you were before the accident. I'm sorry. The cuts from the glass were too deep. We'd, of course, stitched you up, but the scars, they must be dealt with. Nothing is impossible today, the doctor reassured her. Now you know what kind of technology. They'll put you back on your feet in no time. The girl's eyes showed tears. Where is my phone? She asked in a weak voice. I need to call my mom. She's worried. I should have told her a long time ago that we'd reached the guests. And Charles? Suddenly the girl asked, How is he? I want to see him. Is he here too? He's already home. He's lucky. He's practically unhurt. Just shocked from the impact. The doctor handed her the phone. Wouldn't you rather worry about yourself? All right, I'll leave you to it. He's on his way out of the room. Don't talk too long. You should get more rest. When the door closed behind him, Monica dialed her mother's number. Mommy, with tears in her voice, the girl said. Monica heard her mother's frightened voice in the phone. Why can't I reach you? Where have you disappeared? How can you make me worry? I almost went crazy with worry. I don't know where to find you. You didn't leave an address. Where are you? Mommy, please come. I'm very sick. I'm in the hospital. She heard her mother cry out. Then there was a short beep. Monica. A couple hours later, Betty was at her daughter's house. Oh, my darling, how could it be? She wailed when she saw her daughter. She sat down on the edge of the bed, took her bandaged hands in her own, and kissed them. What happened? Barely holding back tears, she asked. Mommy? The girl spoke quietly. Charles and I were on our way to visit his mother, and the car skidded. She fell silent, then grinned crookedly. Am I very ugly? No, you're not, my dear. Betty gently stroked her face hidden under the bandages and smiled. You're the prettiest. You're my daughter. Her mother's heart was bleeding and sobs were ready to burst from her chest, but she held on. 
I have no right to show weakness in front of my daughter. I must be strong, the woman thought. She needs my help now, not my tantrums. The doctor said that surgery would be necessary, but it would have to be paid for. He said it can be fixed. We'll do it. Don't worry. We'll find the money, and Charles will help. Where is he, by the way? What about him you haven't called? He's only got a mild concussion and some minor cuts, but he's okay. He just needs some time to recover. Get his car fixed. He hasn't called yet, but I'm really looking forward to it. Well, all right. That is up. I'm going to go. The doctor said not to stay long, and I'll come back tomorrow. She leaned over and kissed her daughter. Get well. Don't miss me. I love you. The woman left the room and went to the doctor's office. Doctor, tell me, how is Monica's condition? What should I prepare for? I must admit, I can't give you much hope. The cuts are deep, and I'd be more concerned about her mental state. She has yet to realize that her appearance is irretrievably lost. I think your biggest challenges lie ahead. Raise the money for the surgery and be patient. There's a lot riding on this, including you. It will be a terrible blow for her to see herself. Grief-stricken, Betty walked out of the office, tears choking her. She left the hospital, sank down on a park bench without strength, and finally gave vent to her tears. My poor, poor girl, she thought. How unlucky she is. She won't be able to go on stage now. It would kill her. No way. The woman wiped her tears. I'll do anything to get my daughter back to her normal face, no matter how much money it costs. Determined, she drove home. Son. Barbara blocked her son's path. Where are you going? The doctor said to stay in bed a little longer. Mom, I have to go to the hospital. Monica's waiting for me. I can't hide like a coward. You can't go. The woman was frantic. You need to rest. Are you kidding me? Concussion. Look at you. You're still so weak. I won't let you in. Mom, you can see I'm perfectly fine. I should be with her. It's been two days and I'm still lying around. She's waiting for me. She doesn't even know what's wrong with me. She's poor, alone. She's not alone. Pushing her son back to the bed, Barbara said. There are doctors and nurses looking after her. I'm the one looking after you here, and I'm very concerned about your health, and I don't care about your Monica. Get back to bed right now. Mom, I'm fine. I'm healthy now. I want to see Monica. She needs my support. You can't stop me from going to see my fiancé, who I haven't even met yet. We were just on our way over to meet you. Charles sank down on the bed, wrapped his arms around his head. When the accident happened, you know, and it wasn't our fault that it happened. Listen, Mom. He jumped to his feet. I have to be there for her. She needs me. She thinks God knows what she thinks of me. She'll say I've given up, and I'm sitting at home, healthy and strong, while she's still in the hospital. You can't stop me. I'm going to her. That's the way it is. The woman chin up. I'm coming with you, and I'm going to meet this girl. I won't let you go alone, and don't mind. What if you get sick? Why would you go there? She'll feel uncomfortable around you. Let's wait until Monica's out of the hospital. We'll get together at the table like we planned. I still have to get the tickets. We're not going to Finland now, and I've been looking forward to spending Christmas night in a small town in a medieval fortress. It's so romantic. There will be more romantic encounters in your life. Not anytime soon. The man became sad. By the way, you could go there alone. That's not a bad idea. You'll recover from all this horror. Forget it like a bad dream. How could I ever forget Monica's face? You don't know what happened to it. He squeezed his eyes shut remembering the bloody bride. I can't believe all this happened to us. 
Don't torture yourself. It's already happened, and there's nothing you can do about it. You have to go on living. There's nothing wrong with you, and she'll be fine. Mom, if you could see her, she's never going to get better. I have to support her. Poor thing, she doesn't know what's ahead of her. I don't mind, just on my terms. So, what? We go to the hospital together. Otherwise, I won't let you out of the apartment. Don't talk me out of it. Okay, Mom, we'll go together. My son gave in. Monica was dozing. She heard the door creak softly and opened her eyes. Hello, darling. She heard her fiancé's voice. I'm sorry I couldn't visit you sooner. Charles. The girl rejoiced and stood up on the bed. I've been waiting for you to come to me. It's very boring here without you. Lie down, lie down. A young man came to her and lowered himself down beside her. Help me, please, Monica asked. Put a pillow under her back. Sitting down, she asked. How are you feeling? I was really worried about you. You didn't call. You didn't come. I didn't know what was wrong. I'm fine. I wasn't really hurt. I feel fine now. Nothing and not good. Barbara jumped in. He's a victim of the accident, too, but he's trying not to show it. He barely woke up and came straight to the hospital to see you. Monica, meet my mom. Embarrassed by his mother's cold tone, Charles said. Nice to meet you. The girl said quietly, It's a pity we had to meet under such sad circumstances. Barbara said calmly, But I was eager to see the girl my son had told me so much about. What do the doctors say, sweetheart? They say it's going to require plastic surgery. I'm sorry to hear that. I sympathize with Barbara. But you're young, you'll like yourself. When it heals, you'll be as good as new. Monica nodded in agreement, but she kept her eyes on her fiancé. I'm feeling fine now, so I'll come to see you more often, Charles promised. Then you'll get your stitches out and come home. And our wedding? The girl stuttered. The wedding will have to be postponed. Charles looked at her guiltily. I'm sorry about that, but don't worry, we'll be fine. The main thing is to get you out of the hospital as soon as possible. Monica? A nurse came into the room. Let's go to the treatment room. She helped the patient up. I'll do the dressing. Will you wait for me? Monica asked me in a pleading tone. Will you stay with me a little longer? Yes, Charles nodded. Don't worry, I won't leave. Come back soon. As Monica was led away, Barbara turned on her son. What wedding are you talking about? Don't even think about it. I didn't raise you to spend the rest of your days with an invalid. What are you talking about, Mom? Charles was outraged. Monica, not an invalid. We'll operate on her, and more than one if necessary, and she'll be just like she was before. Haven't you realized yet that she won't be the same? You're going to spend the rest of your life working on her plastic surgery. Your father should hear you now, she cried. How much do I miss him? You don't cherish and appreciate me at all. How can you do this to your mother? Why am I being punished like this? Are you going to ruin yourself for some girl? My father and I hoped that we'd be supported in our old age, but you are ungrateful. Don't be silly. Charles hugged his mother. I'm very grateful to you for being faithful to your father all your life. You think he didn't see how hard it was for you? Yes, you were seven when your father was gone. I raised you alone. It's so beautiful to see how handsome you've become. Tall, slender, blue-eyed, and even in high school, girls followed you in droves. Look around, and there are so many beautiful girls, healthy, full of strength. Choose any one. I don't want any others. Charles was stubborn. I want to marry Monica. She'll get well, and you'll see what a wonderful person she is. 
You stubborn, soulless son. Mother was angry. She is not your wife yet, but she has already come between us. And yet I have never wanted anything for you. I have lived for you. And now in my old age, I find out that some girl is dearer to me than my mother. Did I think I'd live to see such black ingratitude for my favorite son? No, mother. In despair, Charles exclaimed, You are both dear to me. She will cost us dearly. Why are you clinging to her? You want to lay your life, your career on the altar of love? Will she appreciate it? I know the kind of girl who'll use it and spit it out. How long does she have to be in therapy? A year, two years. I want to have grandchildren, she cried. I don't know how long I have left in this world. Will she be able to give birth to a healthy hair? I beg you, son, don't ruin yourself. Do you want us to pay her money to leave you alone? What do you need her for? But it's my fault that Monica has become like you don't understand. I can't eat. I can't sleep. I can't sleep. I have nightmares at night with her bloody face in front of me. I must, you know, I must stay with her. It's the pity in you. Mother objected. She's a bad counselor. First of all, you must think of yourself and me. I'm your family. You'll have many women in your life but only one mother. Are you trying to drive me to my grave? Barbara clutched at her heart. Ungrateful. Monica was coming back from the evil office. She was in a hurry to see her fiancé. Her heart was singing. She longed to be with him a little longer. The presence of his mother was a disappointment, for from the first moment, it was clear that she did not approve of her son's choice. But even this circumstance did not prevent the girl from rejoicing at the long-awaited meeting. She had already taken the handle, slightly at the open door, as suddenly heard. Mom. Charles spoke in desperation. Don't make me choose. You know I love you very much, and I realize that I owe you everything. If you love me, if you care about me, give up the idea of marrying Monica. I think she must realize that there can be nothing between you now. Barbara's cold tone struck a chord with the girl. I'll never accept her, and I'll curse you if you dare to bring her into the house. That girl will make our life unbearable and drive me to my grave before my time. If you don't care what happens to us, then marry her. But be warned, I won't help you, and you're still broke. You'll come to your mother, and I won't give my blessing. Live as you like. Monica, holding her breath, waited to see what the groom would say. He was silent. Then a heavy sigh was heard. Yes, Mom, I think you're right. We must weigh everything carefully. I'm glad you listened to my opinion. My darling boy, believe me, I have only your welfare in mind. It's a good thing Monica can't hear us. I must find the right words to explain everything and try not to hurt too much. Oh, son, there were tears in Barbara's voice. How thoughtful are you? Monica stood with her back against the cold wall, tears choking her. The talking had stopped. She opened the door. I'm back. The girl tried to give her voice her usual cheerfulness and pretended she hadn't heard anything. Thank you for waiting for me, but the treatments were so tiring. I'd like to rest. Excuse me, can you leave me alone? Yes, yes. Charles hurried off, pleased to be able to leave. Rest, sleep, is the best medicine for you now. I'll definitely come again when the doctors say it's okay. We'll walk with you in the park. The hospital has a great park. Get well, my dear, Barbara said in an indifferent tone. She looked triumphantly at her daughter-in-law who had failed. She had won the battle for her son. Charles never came to the hospital again. I want to look at myself in the mirror. It was a long time before the sick woman decided to ask the doctor. Are you sure you're ready for the step? I'll have to do it someday anyway, so let it be now. Lisa, bring the mirror into the room and take off the bandages. 
Monica closed her eyes, gathering her strength, then resolutely opened them and saw her reflection. Is that me? Horrified, she asked. Tears welled up in her eyes. A stranger was staring back at her, her face disfigured by scars. One eye was half covered, pulled down by a scar. Another scar fixed the corner of her mouth with a downward slope. The face wasn't alive, as if someone had pulled an intimidating mask over it. And then, Monica moaned helplessly, covering her face with her palms. She scratched at her skin with her fingers as if she wanted to peel it off. How am I going to live with a face like this? I'm ugly. She threw her face on the pillow and sobbed, kalashmally pounding her fists on the bed. She's hysterical. Give her a sedative immediately. The doctor ordered, but he grabbed Monica, turned her around, and hugged her tightly, not letting her break free. She was sobbing and could not stop. The rope on the doctor's chest became wet from her tears. It's okay, it's okay, girl, he pleaded with Monica. You can handle it. You're strong. The main thing is that you're alive. Why should I live like this? Don't you see what's become of me? I'm disgusted with myself, and how will the people around me look at me? Charles? My poor Charles. He was right. I'm ugly. I can't be loved. He was right to leave me. A nurse came and took a sedative. After a few minutes, the girl quieted down, sobbed convulsively a few times, and collapsed in the man's arms. Everything will be all right, said the doctor, putting the patient to bed. He ineptly stroked her head, saying, Everything will get better. Plastic surgeries will do their job and fix her face. But it would never be the same again. As she fell asleep, Monica said, secretly from her mother, Charles found out when Monica was being discharged from the hospital and came to meet her. He was in a hurry, holding a huge bouquet of flowers. Where? When he entered the room, he saw a nurse rearranging the bed where the girl had been lying a short time ago. Monica was discharged. Without stopping what she was doing, the nurse said, You're late. You should have come earlier. What about you, fiancé? I didn't have time. Charles said, confused. He turned around and wanted to leave. She left a letter for you there. He heard behind him. A letter? Where is it? The girl silently took an envelope out of her pocket and handed it to him. Take it. The man handed her a bouquet. This is for you, thank you. He walked out of the hospital into the street and sat down on a bench in the front garden. Dear, beloved Charles, I had no idea that one day I would have to write these lines, but everything changed in an instant. Charles, I heard you talking. The man turned pale as he read those words, and I don't want to be a burden to you. Your mother is right. We can't have anything in common now. I've changed since the accident, and I'll never be the same again. And it's not just my look. I didn't recognize you. I didn't want to believe that I was looking at you, my beloved beauty, my fiancé. The thought gave him a headache. I'd even thought I had made a mistake, and that I was looking at a strange woman. Not you, Monica, whom I adored. The accident had mutilated your lips, your nose, your cheeks. Everything I loved to kiss so much, this face was disgusting. I refused to believe I could see you. I shuddered to imagine having to touch what was once your face. I wouldn't have to deceive you by pretending to love you. You were right to leave without saying goodbye. You were stronger than I was, and it would have been hard for me to tell you all that, but I didn't have to explain. Charles stood up, hesitated for a moment, then tore the letter into small pieces and threw it in the trash. Then he squared his shoulders took a deep breath and walked away from the hospital. Daughter, Betty urged me, eat, you're starving yourself. You're shut up at home, like a snail in a shell. 
You can't torture yourself like that. You're burying yourself alive. Shall we go for a walk? You haven't left your room in so long. I don't want anything, Mom. In a colorless voice, Monica answered. She was lying with her back turned to the wall, wrapped in a blanket. Maybe I want to die. I can't even show my face on the street with this face, and you're asking me to go out. I should only be in horror movies now. My dear, Mother secretly wiped away a tear. You have to live for me. You have arms, legs. You still have a voice after all. Why should I? I'll never be able to go on stage again anyway. I'd rather die than live with the thought that nobody needs me. Don't say that I need you. We'll figure something out. What about Charles? Why doesn't he call? We broke up. Broke up how? Why? Did he leave you at a time like this? That bastard. I don't want to talk about it. He's gone. Leave me alone, please. You poor thing. Her mother sighed heavily and left the room. No way. With these words, Betty sat down at the computer. I'm not going to let you get depressed. There has to be a way out. I'll find a clinic that will help you get back to normal. There you go. After a while, she exclaimed, There is such a clinic, and here is the name of the doctor. Wow, quite young, and already so famous. Let's see some pictures of patients. He's a real talent. I'll send a picture to Monica and make an appointment. That's it. She pressed the key one last time, satisfied. Now we wait for the call. What if Monica refuses to go? Suddenly the woman was afraid. She won't go anywhere. I'll persuade her to go. And if she doesn't, I'll make her go. She's not her own enemy. A couple of weeks later, an invitation for a consultation arrived. Monica. Betty cautiously entered her daughter's room, standing at the window looking out at the street. I have good news for you. The girl silently turned to her mother. I've contacted a doctor at a clinic that specializes in complicated cases like yours. They replied today, they're expecting you for an appointment in a month. Why did you do that? I'm not going anywhere anyway. I'm ugly now. It's like a stigma. How can you imagine me riding on a train? Do you want me to be in full view of everyone and have people pointing fingers at me? Yeah, no one would let me go anywhere. I'm a freak. Don't talk about yourself like that. I won't let anyone insult you. You can't protect me from that. Don't you get it yet? It's mommy, if you can do it, then I agree to go. A few days later, Monica tried on an elegant black mask made of a thin lace veil. It was like a second skin, hiding the scars but contouring the face. There, Betty said, admiring her creation. Now you can only be recognized by your figure, and it's beautiful. The girl stood in front of the mirror and looked at herself. She liked what she saw. Thank you, Mom. I feel more confident now. I'm ready to go to the clinic. Good girl. The woman sighed with relief. There you will definitely help you. I read the reviews. The doctor works real miracles and will help you. I'm sure that we will not go in vain. A couple of days later, they already had tickets for the train. On the appointed day, they arrived in the city, checked into a hotel, and went to look for the clinic. Good afternoon. Betty approached the receptionist's desk. We have an appointment. Yes. The nurse nodded affirmatively after looking at the computer. Come into the office. The doctor is waiting for you. Monica, shy, entered the office. Hello. The doctor smiled at her. Come in and take off your mask, please. What a great idea to protect yourself from prying eyes. I'll have to adopt it. It was my mom's idea. The girl was embarrassed. The man was handsome, with strong but surprisingly soft hands. Did you come by yourself? Asked the doctor, scrutinizing her face, touching the scars. 
He flipped through her medical history, shook his head concernedly. No, with my mom, she's waiting in the hallway. That's good. The doctor looked at the patient thoughtfully. Let's call mom. I understand that she will have to pay for the operation. I don't want to hide anything from you. He spoke as the two women sat down across from him. The case is really complicated. Of course, your surgeon has tried and carefully entered the cuts, but they are deep in some places, so the scars are rough. What should we do? We'd agree to anything, just to restore the face. Monica is a singer. It is very important for her to have a beautiful appearance. Of course, medicine can do a lot of things now but the treatment is long. It will take more than one operation, and all of them are paid because we are a commercial organization. How much money are we talking about? The man thought, wrote a few lines on a paper and handed it to Betty. She turned pale. Is this the total amount for the treatment? No, the cost of one operation. Your daughter's injuries are too extensive. In fact, We'll have to reshape her face to get her back to her former appearance. It's not an easy task, and it has to be done quickly before the scaring fades. If you agree, we'll make a contract and start the treatment right away. We'll have to think about it. Betty looked at her daughter, desperation in her eyes. We didn't expect to need this kind of money. Think about it. The doctor agreed. You have the phone number. And when you're ready, contact us, but I'd advise you not to take too long. Loss of time will worsen the results of treatment. The women left the clinic upset. We'll never raise that much money. Monica said, especially now that you're working alone, we have to think of something. The mother realized that the money was too much for the family. There are some funds. You could apply to them. I'll find out. We'll put a call out on the internet, ask friends, acquaintances. There are many kind people in the world. They will help our grief. We must pull ourselves together. Let's not give in to despair. Mommy. The girl hugged her mother, then pulled away from her and said firmly, I love you very much, but let's face it. No one will give us such money, and we cannot collect it ourselves until the end of the century. We shouldn't cling to our illusions. What do we do? We can't give up. There's no water under the stone. Live, Monica answered simply. If I didn't die in that accident, then we'll live. Now that I have this mask, I'll try to find a job. Everything will be fine. Let's go to the hotel. We'll go home tomorrow. Home and walls help. Surrounded by friends and acquaintances, It'll be easier. It'll never be easier for me now. You go ahead. I want to walk around a bit. See what sights there are around here. I need some time alone. I'm sorry, it's been a long day. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Don't stay too long. It's a strange city. You don't know what's going on. Okay, Mommy, don't worry. Monica walked through the city with interest, looking at the houses the old buildings, the churches. Amazing, she thought, looking around. How the architect of the city was able to link the old and the new city, and no one is bothering anyone. What is this? The girl stopped and listened. Was it just me, or is someone really playing? She walked toward the sound. From the open door of an unremarkable cafe, a familiar tune was playing. Monica smiled, her favorite music, and how great the musician was playing. The girl entered the cafe at this hour. There were almost no visitors. As mesmerized, she sat down near the bar. Will you order something? Looking at her mask with interest, the bartender asked, A glass of juice, please. The girl asked, keeping her eyes on the musician, who was playing without looking at the keys. His thin fingers softly touched the keys, fluttering lightly, subtly over them. The melody faded, and the man put his hands on his knees, continuing to listen to the fading sounds. 
Finally, he stood up and took a seat at the bar as well. His blue eyes, framed by thick, long lashes, stared at her unblinkingly. Why are you looking at me like that? The girl flared under his gaze. Didn't anyone ever tell you that it's unseemly to stare at a stranger? I'm sorry. The man was embarrassed and looked away. They were staring at the same point without blinking. I didn't mean to offend you. Don't think anything bad. I assure you, I had no intention of insulting you. He's blind. Leaning toward her, the bartender whispered, I'm sorry. Monica blushed. I, I didn't know. I'm very embarrassed that I jumped on you. I should be the one apologizing to you. I scared you. I usually stay away from visitors, but you give me such warmth. He was quiet for a moment. What's your name? Monica. I'm Sebastian. I'm very pleased to meet you. He held out his hand, and the girl took it. You have thin fingers and your hand is so delicate. You played very beautifully. She took her hand away gently. There was a look of distress on his face. I came here because I heard the music from afar. Did you like it? The man cheered up. I like to play here. The owner spared no expense and bought a good instrument. It's a pity that there are not so many real music lovers among the visitors. Do you like music? Yes, I do. Monica smiled at the memory. I used to sing in a cafe like this one. Do you sing? Sebastian perked up. How stupid am I? I should have known you had a singing voice. Come on, I want to hear you sing now. He walked confidently toward the instrument. Oh, I'm embarrassed. The girl protested confusedly. You don't know my repertoire. How will you play along with me? You can't see the notes? I'm sorry, I've offended you again. Not at all. Sebastian laughed. You apologize too often. I am used to my position and do not take offense if someone accidentally, awkwardly word hurt me. What will you perform? I don't know. I'm really embarrassed, I'm embarrassed. It's embarrassing to hide my talent. You and I, God gave us the ability to play and sing for people. We have no right to hide it. Sebastian sat down at his instrument and ran across the keys. Start singing. I can pick up the melody. Monica picked up the first notes. She got carried away and didn't notice that the cafe was already full of people. Some of them were even standing, as there were no free tables. The girl looked only at the pianist, reacted to all the changes in his face, and his face spoke more than his eyes. When she sang the third song, the hall exploded with applause. Thank you. Happy, Monica looked around at the audience. She had never been received like this before. More, the audience chanted, sing more, good evening. An imposing older man approached the girl. Your marvelous voice has attracted an unprecedented number of visitors to the cafe. I'm the director of this establishment. I won't go around and around. I'm offering you a job. I'll pay you well. Take it. You have a great do it with Sebastian. You're both very talented. It's a pleasure to have my cafe as a meeting place for you. Oh, that's impossible. Monica was confused. I didn't even think about it. Why not? I'll pay well. We don't have any caps with live music in the city. We'll be the first. We'll make a lot of money. I'm sure no one will offer you more than me. The thing is, I live in another city. I've already got tickets in my pocket, and I'm not likely to ever come back here. Do you have a family? No, I live with my mom. Right now, she's looking forward to having me back a prestigious job you'd hate to lose. I lost it in a car accident. So what's there to think about? The man looked triumphantly at the girl. You have nothing to lose, and here you have already found admirers of your talent and a job. But me, I can only perform in disguise. 
no one will reproach you for that. On the contrary, your unusual appearance gives your image a certain mystery and gives one more reason to come to us to look at you. But first of all, people will go for your voice. I've never heard such a thing. I need to consult with my mom. We're just passing through your town. Think about it, but not for long. I'll see you tomorrow night to sign a cooperation agreement. Monica, say yes. Sebastian stood up from behind his instrument. We'll make a great team. I just met a worthy partner, and I don't want to lose you immediately. The man found her hand and squeezed it. I can't give you an answer right away. I have obligations to my mom. Guiltily, said the girl. Promise me you'll think carefully. The girl warmly said goodbye to her new acquaintance and hurried to the hotel. Daughter, at last. I've been worried sick. Betty met her daughter right at the threshold, as if she was standing at the door, waiting for her to enter the room. Where have you been so long? I thought you were lost or something. Mommy. Monica hugged her mother and spun her around. Do you have no idea what has happened to me in these few hours? I'm staying here. What? What do you mean you're staying here? No, no, I don't want to hear anything. The woman protested. We're leaving here tomorrow. There's nothing to keep us here. I'm not going anywhere. I've been offered a job. What kind of job? I'll sing in a cafe. But you can sing in our town. Why stay here? There are strangers around. That's what I wanted to tell you. I met a man. Yeah, when did you meet him? Now, Mom, he plays so well you can hear it. He's so handsome, so kind, so gentle. I can't believe it. When did you see all these qualities in him? Sometimes it only takes a minute to realize that he's the one for you. Now I know for sure that love at first sight is real. He's like that, she hugged her mother. I'll introduce you to him. Sebastian is a wonderful person, staying in a strange city among strangers. The mother got out of her daughter's embrace. That's not what you're doing. Mommy, I'm an adult, and I can already manage my own life. I have nothing to lose. I was abandoned by the man I love, fired from my old job. I have nothing to hold me back. And here, in this city, I can start from scratch. What about me? There were tears in Betty's eyes. You haven't thought at all about what's going to happen to me. You don't need me anymore. No, no, of course I do. Sweet, dear Mommy, I'm so grateful for your support. I promise I'll come as soon as I have any free moment and you'll come to me. I will never stop loving you, Mommy. You've done so much for me. Her daughter hugged her. But now I want to take care of you myself. This is my chance to try to be happy. And this man you speak of, how did he feel about your looks? Mom, Monica confessed. He, he's blind. He doesn't see me. And to everyone else my face is hidden under the mask you sewed. No one here knows of my misfortune. They are only interested in my voice. You should see the way I've been received. I feel needed again. Well, my dear daughter, you really have a right to your life. I won't hold you back. What's most important to a mother is that her child be happy. Thank you, Mommy. You must have really found yourself. I haven't seen the sparkle in your eyes in a long time. It's the selfishness of parenthood and the desire to protect my child from adversity. Mommy... You're the only reason I'm alive. You're the best mom in the world. The next day, Monica saw her mother off and went to the store. She had to find a concert dress. This dress suits you very well. The sales clerk looked at her with admiration. It fits you perfectly. It emphasizes your figure. I also need shoes. High-heeled shoes came right away. Let me offer you this pearl necklace. It will bring a touch of freshness to your dark color scheme. Thank you. Critically examining herself in the mirror, the girl said, I like it. 
The only thing missing is gloves. She showed her scarred hands. The sales clerk looked at them fearfully and pulled out long lace gloves. You'll be irresistible in this outfit. She remarked, back at the inn, Monica changed her clothes, styling her thick, dark hair. She stood for a moment, critically assessing herself in the mirror. Now I'm a real artist. The girl smiled at her reflection. I thought life was over after the accident. I condemned myself, but all is not lost. Sebastian was playing something, sitting at the piano, but as soon as the girl entered the cafe, he immediately raised his head. Monica? He rejoiced. You haven't left. How did you know that I entered? She wondered. I felt your presence. So you're staying? Yes, I've decided to stay. She walked over to him and stopped beside the instrument. I'm very glad. The man held out his hand. Monica shook it. Sebastian brought it to his lips and kissed it. Your hands smell minty. It's the cream. Monica was embarrassed. She was embarrassed by his blatant attention, though she enjoyed being near him. You know you can tell a lot about a person by their smell. What can you tell about me? The girl laughed. You are a calm, gentle person, absolutely not conflicted, and now mint helps you cope with depression, am I right? Right. Monica raised her eyebrows in surprise. How do you know all this? If a person loses a feeling, he immediately gains other possibilities. We'll come back to our conversation, but now let's not disappoint the visitors. They've been waiting for you to sing something for a long time. He picked up the first notes and Monica sang. Her voice sounded tentative at first, but then grew stronger. She didn't look at the audience. She looked at Sebastian, mesmerized by his playing. His face shone, the look in his sightless eyes mesmerizing. The girl felt his silent support. He listened to her voice, and his expression gradually changed. At first it was tense, he was worried about her. Then the tension subsided, and he calmed down, rejoicing in her success. Bravo! The visitor shouted. When the last sounds of the piano died down, they applauded and laughed. Someone handed flowers to the happy Monica, and she kept her eyes on her new acquaintance, a peaceful smile on his face. Monica, you have a real talent, admired the cafe director. I'm lucky you stopped by. You should be on the big stage. I like chamber concerts. The girl smiled modestly. I don't seek publicity. I'm not asking. He whispered in her ear. Why are you in a mask? But people are lost in speculation, trying to find out your secret. Can I not explain anything? She asked. This subject is too painful for me. All right, all right. But is there anything I can do for you? I'm staying at a hotel where I can get a place to stay. I have just the perfect place for you. The director was pleased. My sister rents out a room. I think I can make a deal with her. I'm sure she'll meet you and lower the price. You'll be comfortable there, especially since the house isn't far from the cafe. Oh, that would be wonderful. Thank you very much. Your workday is at an end. We'll go to the hotel now, and then I'll take you to the apartment, show you around, and help you get settled. Monica said a warm goodbye to Sebastian and went to pack her things. Daughter? Betty called her every night. I'm very worried. How are you doing alone? Are you being abused? And the apartment you're living in? I'm fine. The girl assured her mother, I like working here. People are helpful, so well received. At work I forget about my problem. How are you feeling? You haven't eaten anything at home, only cried, and there are no friends or acquaintances there. Take care of yourself, my dear. I have music. Monica answered simply, I don't feel inferior anymore. My gigs are waiting. I like this life. 
I've accepted the fact that I'll have to wear a mask for the rest of my life. You know, there's an upside to that. No one can see my face, and I can observe everyone unobstructed. I'd assure you, it's fascinating. And how's your new acquaintance? Sebastian? Monica blushed. I think fate brought us together in the city, in this cafe. He and I are on the same wavelength, musically. We don't even need to talk. Everything becomes clear when he plays and I sing. Our hearts beat in unison. And yet, I'm still a little uneasy. You don't know anything about him. You have nothing to worry about. Neither he nor I talk about our past. I guess it's not time yet. We're just good together. You don't think about Charles at all? No, I'm over that pain. And it's a good thing we broke up, because otherwise I never would have met Sebastian. He means a lot to me. After these conversations, Monica couldn't sleep for a long time. She lay in the dark and remembered the light, casual touch of Sebastian's hand, the warm smile he gave her when he sensed that she was upset about something. And yet she was desperate to know what had happened to Sebastian, what had caused him to go blind. Monica? Sebastian suggested to her one day when the customers had already left. Why don't we go for a walk? It's such a lovely evening. It's a shame to go home. I agree. I don't want to go back to my cramped room either. They walked in silence, each thinking about something else. Sebastian? A girl broke the silence. What did you do before? You wouldn't believe it. He grinned bitterly. An accountant. An accountant? The girl was amazed. But you play so well. I thought you had a conservatory behind you. When I was a kid, I went to an ordinary music school. I really liked playing the piano. Whenever I had a free minute, I'd sit down at the instrument and play from memory. You know, there are people who can type blindly without looking at the keyboard, and that's how I learned to play. I don't need notes. I have a good musical memory. If it weren't for that, I'd be long gone by now. The man was silent, as if realizing that he had spoken. His lips were tightly pressed together, and his cheekbones were set. Monica remained silent, afraid to break the moment of candor and waiting for Sebastian to continue his confession, and she was not mistaken. I had a fiancé. He grinned bitterly. We dated for a long time, and then I decided to propose to her. I don't know what always stopped me from taking that step. Maybe the sixth sense? He grinned again. It warned you of trouble. She was very pretty. She liked attention from men, dressed flashy, bright, even provocative. I had to rescue her from her obsessive admirers. I'd even asked her to dress more modestly, but she laughed at me, saying that I am possessive and she wants to stand out from the crowd that she will still have time to play a modest woman mystery when there will be children. She wouldn't listen to anything, preferring to show everything that nature had bestowed on her. Did you love her very much? Madly. Even with her antics. The wedding preparations were in full swing. We were both over the moon and looking forward to it. Why didn't I insist that night that she change her outfit? He stopped talking again. What happened? Monica asked. That night we left the restaurant and some thugs followed us. My fiancé took the liberty of flirting with them, she always did. She liked to drive men crazy. She enjoyed feeling power over them. Was it your attention enough for her? She liked to tickle my nerves. He smiled wryly said it made me more passionate. And what happened next? Random admirers decided they could invite her to continue the evening. I naturally tried to explain to them that they had misunderstood her behavior and she wasn't going anywhere with them. They were drunk, of course. Yes, a fight ensued. While I was dealing with two of them, the third one came up behind me and hit me on the head with something heavy. I woke up in the hospital in total darkness. The doctors were hopeful at first that my eyesight would return. I waited for a month, but
but alas, no miracle. The diagnosis was total blindness. What about your fiancé? Fiancé? She left me the day she heard the doctor's verdict. Disabled, she didn't need me anymore. I had to quit my job. I didn't know where to put myself. All the doors closed in front of me. They offered only low-paid positions. I did not accept. I needed money for rehabilitation and treatment. All my searches were in vain. And that's when you took the job at this cafe? Yes. I heard one of the customers playing a tune, sat down at the instrument and played. The owner offered me a job. So I took it. The pay is good and sometimes the customers tip well. I like what I do. Sebastian and Monica stopped by a street lamp that lit their faces well. But lately, I've been flying instead of going to work. The man confessed, looking at the girl point blank, as he had when they first met. It even seemed to her that he could see her. I am happy that you once accidentally heard me play. I think I was playing especially for you so that my music would lead you to me. He touched his hand to the mask, a look of bewilderment on his face. Sebastian carefully removed it. Don't. Monica protested. You won't like what's under the mask, but the man took her face in his hands and kissed her lightly, then ran his hand over her skin, felt the scars, and turned pale. I knew I would disgust you. Tears showed in the girl's eyes, one rolled down her mangled cheek. No, he ran his thumb gently over her skin, wiping away the tears. I don't know what happened to you. I can't see your face, but I can feel your soul. Remember I said that nature takes one thing from a man and gives him another. I fell in love with you like a boy the first minute I heard your voice, and then I realized that you are an amazingly delicate and vulnerable person and as lonely as I am. Yes, I lost my sight, but in return I received a real gift from God to meet you, and now I can't imagine life without you. Do you believe me? Sebastian looked at her without pity, without fear. In his eyes there was only love. He pressed her to him and kissed her, and she reciprocated. Can you hear the music in my heart? Yes, barely audible, Monica whispered. She was unusually excited by the kiss. It seemed to her that for a moment they were both lifted off the ground. So strong, so vivid was their mutual feeling. My heart is singing for you, only you will hear it. I couldn't even imagine that one could fall in love like this. Now there is something to live for. I'm happy, and I'm happy. They stood hugging each other for a long time. Monica hid her face on his chest, feeling protected. They felt good together. They had each other now. Son, Barbara announced joyfully, I've found you a bride. It's a great match. I've always dreamed of such a daughter-in-law. Mom, Charles wrinkled his nose. He was tired of the brides his mother offered him. I'm not getting married yet. Why not? Are you still hung up on that, Monica? I thought you were done with your ugly fiancé. Don't start, Mom. The man wrinkled his nose. I've turned over a new leaf in my life. Good for you. Tomorrow, Kelly has agreed to come and visit us. You'll see she'll be a wonderful wife to you. You'd be kind enough to be hospitable. I hope you'll listen to what I have to say. Take a good look at her. You know Mom never gives you bad advice. The next evening, a rich table was set in anticipation of the guest. Go open the door. Mother said, when she heard the bell ring, Hello! On the threshold stood a gorgeous blonde with high, firm breasts. Blue eyes looked appraising. Plump lips opened invitingly in anticipation of a kiss. Hello! A dumbfounded Charles backed away, letting the beauty into the apartment. Kelly, Barbara sang, We've been waiting for you. Come in, darling. Ignoring the oaf, he had forgotten how to court women. Have a seat at the table. 
Charles. She looked sternly at her son. Pour us each a glass of wine. I suggest we drink to the meeting. The evening flew by. The young woman was talkative and well-read. Charles kept his eyes on her. Only sometimes a shadow came over his face when the image of Monica involuntarily appeared in his memory. Kelly was the complete opposite of her. She had none of Monica's modesty, refinement, or malleability. He pondered, looking at the girl. But she's so damn attractive and uninhibited, and I like that. Well, what do you say, son? Cleaning up the table, Barbara asked. I told you that she is a very nice girl, not like that bride of yours, who is not ashamed to go out with her. And she's beautiful, smart, and can hold a conversation. You couldn't find a better wife. Why don't you say something? I noticed right away that you had your eye on her. I won't deny the obvious, Charles sighed. I liked her. Good. My mother rejoiced. Don't delay, meet her again, and then propose. Don't hesitate. You're not a boy anymore. You are both people established, and there and soon have children. She sobbed. Will I really live to see my grandchildren? Finally, my heart will calm down. You've made me happy, son. You've made me happy. Three months later, Kelly was wearing a wedding ring on her ring finger. Barbara loved her daughter-in-law. Look at the cream Kelly gave me, son. She bragged. Her face was as soft as a baby's. Charles. She was indignant after a while. Kelly complains that you don't want to go on vacation with her, says you don't pay any attention to her. I'd love to go, sarcastically responded to the mother's remark, the man. If your Kelly would learn to save a little, and then I do not have time to earn money, and she lets them go for all sorts of nonsense. You two go together. I see you two are getting along well. I'm grateful. Your wife makes your home cozy, and you're always dissatisfied with her. Look how nice your place is now. She's the only thing that makes you look like a decent man. What do you miss? She complained about me. No, really? I can see how you feel about her. Don't you realize your coldness hurts your wife? Don't interfere in our relationship. The man lost his temper. We'll work it out ourselves. Son, how do you talk to your mother? I'm sorry, Mom, but you're always telling me how to live my life. I'm not a little boy anymore. This is my family and my wife. We'll work out our own problems. Frustrated, Charles came home. What's your problem? He went off on his wife. I work like an ox so that you can visit beauty salons and expensive clothes stores, and you complain to your mother that I don't pay enough attention to you. Why don't you tell her why I'm hardly ever home? Why do you resent me, dear? Kelly spoke peacefully, kissing her husband. He pushed her away. You? How rude are you? Nothing terrible happened, just to talk about the fact that you are rarely at home. Think, offended. You don't know why I've been missing work, because I don't have time to rest. I have to work and work to pay your endless bills, your massages, your manicures. Damn them all. You didn't spare any money for me. The woman was ready to use her main weapon, tears. When I persuaded you to marry you, said you loved you, gave you gifts, and swore fidelity. Yes, I thought I was in love with you. But now I realize I made a big mistake. I rushed into marriage so my mom wouldn't bother me anymore. It's her choice. You two are both bugging me. You've drunk all my blood. You can't get enough. Oh, is that how you talk? Kelly cried. So get out of the house. I'd rather sleep at work than live under the same roof with a hysteric like you. Go away, she shouted after him. Nobody's going to cry. Charles ran out of the house, slamming the door in his heart. He walked through town thinking, Why did I listen to my mother? I don't love my wife. I'm a miserable man. At least I can be honest with myself. I still love Monica. I can't forget her. Where is she now? 
Since that memorable day when I lost sight of her, so much water has passed. Her phone is silent. What about her? How's she doing? I'm still tormented by the guilt I feel for her. He walked on, unable to see anyone around him. Suddenly, Charles stopped, listened. What the hell? A long-forgotten warm feeling stirred in his heart, remembering something dear, native. Who is it singing? The man rushed to the sound of the marvelous voice, afraid that now the song would fall silent and he would not be able to find the singer. Charles literally ran into the cafe and froze. Monica was standing at the microphone. Her face was hidden by a mask, but her voice, her figure, he would have recognized her even in the crowd. The patrons applauded as the last sounds of music died down. Monica. Charles stepped toward his former lover. I was looking for you, but I didn't expect to find you here. Your voice brought me here. Hello, Charles. The woman spoke calmly. Why were you looking for me? I missed you. Have you forgotten me? Even if I wanted to forget, I couldn't. She grinned. My face reminds me of you every morning and evening. The rest of the time, I hide behind a mask and am quite content with my life. Why did you come here? You have the right to reproach me. I admit I was mean to you then, but it's never too late to make things right. I want you to come back to me. I've changed, but I still love you. Please, I'm sorry. Can we start over? It's too late. I've changed too. I've learned to see the falseness in people. Have you forgotten how good we were together? I can't live without you. Can't live without you so much that you got married. She nodded at her wedding ring. This marriage means nothing to me. He hurriedly took off the ring and carefully put it in his pocket. I still remember our meetings, our kisses. I don't love Kelly, but I love my husband, and I'm not going to change a thing. If you'd come back when I needed you most, when I didn't want to live, then we could have been happy again, but you chickened out, hid under your mom's skirt. Yes, I made a cruel mistake, I admit it, but you have to understand me. I was scared. Forgive me, forgive me, I was a fool. I didn't realize what a treasure I'd lost. Only now I realize how much you meant to me. You have the right to hate me, I'll bear it. Just don't send me away. I forgave you long ago. Monica looked at her former lover with pity, and I don't hate you. Strangely enough, I'm even grateful because the ordeal has made me strong. Then give me a chance, please. We can try to be happy. I am already happy, answered Monica. I have a caring husband, and we are expecting a child. Charles only now noticed the rounded belly of his former lover. He stood silently and watched as Monica returned to the microphone. A melody played, and the woman sang. The man saw how lovingly she looked at the musician and realized that he had lost her forever. Charles turned around and walked down the street. He was returning to his home, and a song about love, loyalty, and happiness gained was singing after him.